And we're good. Right. Here we go then. The tension is palpable. In the Peloton, there is no breakaway at the moment. That slightly puts me on edge. But I still believe. Everything will be just fine. And this channel will stay alive, thanks to the breakaway going. Here it is then. Stage 17 of the Tour de France. And it's a big day ahead of us. We are going to Super Devoli. And it's going to be a day for the Hillier riders to have a hit out at a stage win. You would hope. But one thing that is happening is the breeze is a blowing. And that's going to mean tension. And that's going to mean crashes. And that is going to mean potential GC action. But for the moment, everything is calm. As we exit San Paul Trois Chateau, and we are on the road to Super Devoli. Here is what the stage looks like. I'm sure you can see it at the top of the PCS screen. But here it is in real form. We start in San Paul Trois Chateau. It's 178 kilometers, and it's a long, flat portion to begin the day. That should be where we see the breakaway form. But it will be towards the end where all the action happens, I think. Unless the wind does seriously blow, which it looks like it might do. We go to Vane for the intermediate sprint. Suddenly, the intermediate sprints have so much interest and intrigue in what will happen. Now that we've got two riders that are fighting for it. But... The focus for me is on the climbs. We begin with the category 2 Col Bayard, 6.8 kilometres, 7.3% average gradient. And then the biggest one of the three, the Col de Noyer, 7.5 kilometres, over 8% on average. And there are bonus seconds to be handed out over the top of the climb. I think it's 8, 5, and 2. I could be wrong. And then the Category 3 Super Devoli to finish off the stage. 3.8 kilometres, 5.9% on average to end off the day. Not the hardest climb of the lot. But suddenly the race has got hard. And it's thanks to FDJ and Stefan Kuhn who are pressurising things at the front. Cunha is starting to hit out, as is an EF rider. That looks like Ben Healy. What a surprise. The man that has been all around the breakaways, but never found himself in a winning position. He's at the back of an EF train of four now. And everybody wants to get in prime position. Nylands is up there on the right-hand side. Could be a day for him for Israel Premier Tech. And Tade Pogaccia is sat at around 10th wheel. Right towards the front, two wheels behind Jonas Vingegaard in the Visma Lisa bike train. Here's what UAE have to say on the team radio. Pogaccia says, guys, we need to get to the front, okay? I think something is cooking up. So Pogaccia is worried. He's on his toes and he is ready to mark the Visma Lisa bike offensive. So Visma are moving up on the right-hand side, and it is Bart Lemon that is kicking things off for them. He's got Tej Benut on his wheel, and on Benut's wheel is the polka dot jersey of Jonas Vingegaard. As Armirai has already been distanced, he is the first rider to have been dropped off of this pace. So not a day for Bruno Armirai to find himself in the breakaway You'd have thought a day like this would suit him. There's an Astana rider there as well. It's not Mark Cavendish. It's... I, I want to say that was Alexei Lutsenko, which worries me greatly. A little bit of conversation between Bart Lemon and Christophe Laporte on the front of the peloton at the moment, which Visma Lisa Biker controlling. 
However, Ineos, who are also good in the crosswinds, have come to the front as well. Ben Turner is towards the head of affairs. He's got Carlos Rodriguez on his wheel. And then comes Geraint Thomas and Egan Bernal in a four-man Ineos Grenadiers train. Moving up as well, a Sudal quick step. There's a frantic nature in the peloton right now. Mathieu van der Poel's towards the front. All of the big hitters. Remco Evenepoel has been moved up by his team. And teams are starting to get worried about the conditions. Matej Mohoric is there. Alexander Kristoff now at the front for Uno X. It is getting very frantic and very hectic in the peloton. And we're only 8 kilometres into the stage. 170.2 kilometres to go now if you want to follow along. And sync up your stream with mine. But we are yet to see a proper acceleration come from the peloton. On a day that I thought would be for the breakaway, the winds blowing up once again are putting the peloton on edge. EF retain their position at the front now. They've moved back towards the head of affairs. And at the moment, they're following the wheel of a Movistar rider. Mihal Kwiatkowski is towards the front as well. He's been dislodged from his Ineos train. But is a master in these kind of conditions. Marijn Vandenberg trying to position Carapaz and Healy, you'd think, to go for the stage. This could be a little bit of a Nielsen Paulus day as well. I was thinking about Sean Quinn, but I think that Col de Noyer is a little bit too large for the American national champion to be competitive. But once again, the peloton is at Cetris Paribus. That's not the, the right use of Cetris Paribus, but it doesn't matter. Nils Pollitt now towards the front. First we've seen of his teeth for UAE Team Emirates. And suddenly now the crosswinds are forming. Riders are getting into echelon formation and it is about to get plunged into the gutter. Steph Kras is being distanced and suddenly we've ripped a group away at the front. It's a large group and it's a group which includes the yellow jersey. Arno Delis in there I can see in the Belgian national champions kit. But EF at the moment are the team putting this one into the gutter and it's Marijn Vandenberg that is doing the majority of the pacing. At the moment, Steph Kras is the biggest rider to have been dropped. Along with Louis Meinches, who is in the same group as Kras. Julian Bernard has just been distanced from the Kras group, and it's not extensive, the gaps. But they are beginning to form. The crosswinds are blowing, and we have a very, very interesting start to today's stage. Bogarch is towards the front. He's sat about 15th wheel, trying to keep himself away from any splits. But the splits are occurring, and it is frantic for anybody to get back on into the peloton. A couple of UAE riders now in Group 2, headed by Kevin Jeunets for FDJ at the moment. So they've missed the split with one of their key riders. Whether that's David Gordou or Lenny Martinez, I am not sure. I can Jan here to off the back as well. He's been distanced by this pace. Poor Jan here, man. The first guy to crash at this tour before stage one even started. Chipped a couple of teeth. But Burgado is in the group with Steph Kras. Pretty much the whole Total Energy train have missed this. And now Pogacar is pulling. And we have an echelon forming. And it is a Echelon full of big hitters. Remco Evenepoel is there. Jonas Vingegaard is there. So the top three in GC are safe. Alexander Kristoff does a turn on the front for Uno X. He hands over to Nils Pollitt. Pollitt will hand over to Tade Pogacar. And it is starting to go in the gutter once again. The whole peloton is strung out and it's about to split into several pieces once riders cannot hold the wheel. They will pull off. And you will get the diagonal echelon formation once more. 
So all the groups have come back together apart from the Steph Kras Louis Meinches group. There is one UAE Team Emirates rider in there, and that is Marc Soler. Julian Bonar hanging on to the back of that group. Bobby Youngrels is also in that split. Walt Poles has been distanced, as well as Kevin Vokelat. Number 53 in that group is Sam Bennett. Of course, he's not going to be going for, for today. But he'll want to finish within the time limit. And being distanced this early is not good for him, especially on the flat terrain. Adam Yates is also involved in the group that has been distanced. So Soler and Yates for UAE Team Emirates have missed the split that has been forced by Pollock and Pogaccia in part. So this was not the start that I was expecting, but it was a start that I was hoping for, at least. There was rumour of crosswinds, that the winds would be higher on this stage than they will be throughout the Tour de France. So this is the stage where the peloton's on high alert, and once again, the echelons are beginning to form, and riders are beginning to get spat out of the leading group. Pogacar is not one of them, and neither is Jonas Vingegaard. Remco Evenepoel as well is in that front group. The front selection of around, last time the helicopter camera went up, 45-ish, 40 riders maybe. But riders have been distanced. They are correct. Soler and Yates are in the group far off the back. One of the Ineos riders as well is there. Walt Pools, Louis Meinches, Julian Bernard, Steph Kras also in this group. So plenty of potential hitters for the stage win. As well as important teammates for GC riders. No Visma Lisa bike riders have been caught out right at the back. But now you have the group in front, which includes the likes of Kevin Ginietz. There's another UAE rider nestled towards the rear of that group. But as we're going through a town now, the winds will slow. And it's a chance for everybody to get back together and a sense of calm to emerge on the peloton. That is exactly what is going on. So an early scare for UAE, Marc Soler and Adam Yates in particular as fighting to get back on to the rear of the peloton, is Dan McClay. He's the rider at the back of the peloton at the moment, but at least he's ahead of our last echelon group on the road. They're just gradually making their way back on to the rear of this peloton. But for the moment, they are still dropped. Riders involved include the likes of Nelson Oliveira, so they've got a key rider on the flat if they need it. Bob Jungles is there, and he's got a teammate with him too in Marco Haller. So it proves that the big engines can miss this move. Jan here is there for Sudal Quickstep, as well as Jordan Jegat. He could have been a potential rider to go into the breakaway. He's got Bergado Dujardin, Steph Kras as well with him, as well as Matteo Verche. So a lot of the Total Energy team have been poorly positioned entering this first crosswind section. And it shows you that it's more about positioning than your power, because some of the big riders, Marco Haller, Bob Jungles, etc., have totally missed this. And at the moment, it is Team Ineos and Ben Turner who are pacing on the front of the peloton for now. They have classified the second group on the road as group Sam Bennett. So he's in there for Decathlon as you desert. But what a start to the race it's been. Matej Mohoric now piloting Santiago Buitrago. Top 10 in GC for the Colombian for the moment. And a chance to gain some time on his GC rivals on a stage like today. Red Bull Bora Hansgrohe are now surging to the front on the left-hand side. They're two teammates down. And are perhaps looking for Jai Hindley or Matteo Sobrero to get into the breakaway today. The second group on the road is 200 metres behind the lead of the race. 15 seconds on the road. 
it's kicked off from kilometre one, perhaps not in the way I was expecting. But it's certainly entertaining to watch. It's always entertaining to watch an echelon formation. Just because it's a, a time when it isn't purely luck-based, but anybody can be anywhere on the road. The Ineos rider that has been dropped out of interest is Lawrence de Plus, who is a key rider. Kevin Vorkala is towards the back as well. Or Christian Eiking is an Uno X rider who is involved. And so is Walt Pauls. Perhaps today wouldn't be his day with shorter climbs on the menu, but he'll be looking at something like the Isola 2000 stage potentially as an opportunity from the breakaway. But the peloton are moving and shifting around. And you never know when the next echelon is going to come. You can turn a corner and the wind will suddenly be in your favour and that is when you force it to the front. Tadej Pogacar moving up right-hand side in the yellow jersey. Trying not to get too involved, but everybody is meshed together in this peloton. There's not much room for manoeuvre at all. And that is because nobody wants to miss the splits. Everybody at the moment is on edge. They know that if they do miss it, they're going to be doing a chase similar to the Bennett's group at the moment, who have kept the gap at between 10 and 15 seconds. They're slowly pulling it back, but it's going to be a lot of effort expended for this group of Sam Bennett and many other riders too. A rider who was involved in the infamous Remco Evenepoel, Visma Lisa bike and Tadej Pogacar split a couple of days ago. Pascal Ackerman finds himself in this group off the back as well. So once again, he is a big rider with a big engine who does well on the flat and has totally missed this. And is paying the price for it at the moment. But I think contact will be made. The peloton are now seven or eight riders wide the pace has totally gone out of the head of the race and the group of Steph Krass are slowly closing to the rear of the peloton Lutsenko and Armourai have been more than dropped now they are behind the Steph Krass group so they've got a real mission to try and get onto the peloton before things spark up and the breakaways start forming or another echelon. Suddenly, the intermediate sprint of Vane is going to come on up on us very quickly, I suspect. 159.7 kilometers to go. Armirai is making his way back on there was no issue for Armirai or Lutsenko on the radio, so looks like it was just a mechanical of the legs for now. But Sivakov as well as towards the back for UAE Team Emirates. Armirai's going to make his way back on, drafting in a couple of the cars. And we are back and calm again in the peloton. How long will that last? I am not so sure. But let's have a look at the classifications going into today then. Here's the GC. Could this change around at the end of today? I suspect so, especially already with Adam Yates being involved in riders that were dropped. Teddy Podarcha leads the way. He's in the yellow jersey. He's got three minutes and nine seconds on Jonas Vingador in second. Remco Evenepoel is third for Sudal Quickstep at five minutes and 19 seconds. Schwawa made a fourth for UAE Team Emirates at over 10 minutes down, just under 11. Mikael Landa at 11 minutes 21. He was the best manoeuvrer on the Plateau de Bay stage. Found himself up in fifth now. 
at 11 minutes and 21 seconds. Six seconds behind Lander is Carlos Rodriguez of Ineos Grenadiers in sixth. Adam Yates, the man who missed the split, originally is in seventh at 13 minutes 38, followed by Julia Ciccone in eighth for Little Trek at 15 minutes 48. Derek G and Santiago Buitrago will be joined, I'm sure, by Felix Gall in a three-way battle for the top 10, in which two of them can make it. All of them are over 16 minutes down on Tade Pogaccia in yellow. And in terms of the other classifications, Remco Evenepoel will wear the white jersey. He's He's been in the saddle for over 66 hours. Carlos Rodriguez in second at 6 minutes and 8 seconds behind Evenepoel with Buitrago third at 11 minutes and 13. Now the real battle to watch in terms of classifications for today is the green jersey. That is because Biniam Gilmai could not take any points in yesterday's sprint stage after a crash. And that hands over an opportunity to Jasper Philipson to try and steal the jersey off the Eritrean who has worn it for so much of this Tour de France. Gilmai leads the way for Intermarche Wanty on 376 and the gap now is within reach for Jasper Philipson, but it is going to be incredibly difficult. 32 points is the gap. He's on 344 for Alperson de Koenig. Brian Crocar of Covidis will hope to retain his third place from a charging Anthony Turgis, who was involved yesterday. He's on 179 points, but will not trouble the top two. Once again, the situation comes back to calmness. We've got six riders at the front of the peloton for the moment. Uno Exa represented, Sudar Quickstepper represented, UAE Team Emirates, Visma Lisa Bike as well are there. And they're just keeping their riders towards the front, Jonas Vingegaard. And for Uno X, you'd be thinking somebody like Tobias Haaland, Johannesson for today. Or Johannes Kulset. I would have potentially said Eiking as well for today, but he has already been involved in a frantic chase to make it back to the peloton. So maybe not him. As we get some lovely views. But here's the King of the Mountains classification. And it is the top three in GC. Pogaccia leads the way on 77. Jonas Vingegaard is 19 points behind on 58 points, with Remco even a Poland third on 42. And that is your review of the minor classifications. But they're going to be ones that are super interesting to watch, at least excluding the white jersey. Because I think that's all but sealed for Remco even a Poland. The green jersey is going to be the real one to watch today. Because all of a sudden, Jasper Philipson and Alpacinda Koenig have thrown themselves into the ring with a chance at taking home a jersey. 156 and a half kilometres remain in the day and we've had no breakaway from the start. Everybody's been worried about the wins and this time they have had a right to be worried it was nothing more than a light breeze yesterday that was putting people off but the winds have been blowing at the start of the race and somebody else who has been blowing is Alexei Luxenko he's really struggled from the flag drop to hold the pace he's got six tons of gels stored down his jersey pockets Perhaps to be handed out amongst the Astana team. Perhaps to be consumed by himself. But he has made it to the back. He's just drafting a couple of the team cars now to make it onto the rear of the peloton. But I think he will do so. And an early scare for Lutsenko is averted. At least for now. We'll see whether that was just bad legs or whether that was an unfortunate circumstance later on in the day.
but if you're Mark Cavendish as well, that could be a problem because he was one of the important Astana teammates that helped him across the finish line on the Plateau du Bay stage. Just over a minute and a half within the time limit. So Cavendish has a key ally back in the peloton. We will go through what he's been saying later on in the day. But I am waiting for the breakaway to form. And it feels like it's going to go at any moment now. Because we've got a long straight road where the wind direction will not change. So it's an opportunity for a rider to throw themselves into the breakaway. It is not looking good for my prediction of the breakaway going the distance, but it looks like we've got a tax now because once again the pace has been upped. The peloton has gone from wide to gradually thinning. After an attack from Lotto Destiny, but it's all been in vain, and this is where it begins then. Riders trying to get themselves involved in a breakaway. Paul Lapeyra towards the front in the French National Champions jersey. He's on the wheel of Tadej Pogacar at the moment. Perhaps looking to find himself in a breakaway. Biniam Gilmay is moving up as well through the middle. At the moment he's sat around 20th wheel. Nicely tucked in for the moment, but he's lost all of his teammates for now. Remco Evenepoel is in there as well. And Jonas Vingegaard is sat on the wheel of Biniam Gilmay. Van der Poel is situated on the left-hand side of the road. He's sat fifth wheel. Remco Evenepoel is sat second wheel on the left. Behind a teammate for the moment. But again, it's tense, it's nervy, and everybody is looking at each other to begin the attacking. We saw on the stage to Plateau de Bay, stage 15, Bob Jungles just force a move off the front on his own. Ended up in a solo breakaway, was eventually caught by a large group very shortly afterward. But it meant that he was in the breakaway, so... It's going to have to take somebody to begin the attacking, I think. Tobias Harlan Johannesson is towards the front, as well as Matteo Sobrero. Two riders who I'm sure have looked at today and seen a chance. But for now, there is no movement. We've had one acceleration from Lotto Destiny. That was tracked by multiple Uno X riders. But it was pulled back by the peloton. And the longer this goes on, the more of a chance for Alperson de Koenig to try and force something at the intermediate sprint for Jasper Philipson. The winner of yesterday's stage, of course. But at the moment, everybody now is together. No riders have been dropped off the back. Nobody's getting any supplies from the team car because they're worried that the winds might start blowing up again. And for now, the breakaway is still yet to form. So the whole peloton is crammed together. Luckily, it's a four-lane road, so... There is plenty of space for movement. As Dion Martin is off the back of the peloton, as soon as I say everybody's together, he's looking for assistance from the Kofidis team car. Varden Scholl towards the front. You'll be expecting him to be a tug buddy in the breakaway for somebody. Getting one of the Uno X climbers onto his wheel. And propelling him towards the breakaway. But after 25 kilometres. There has been no breakaway. Guillaume Martin is after a bottle I think. From the team car. 
as Dylan Kronavagen sits towards the rear of the peloton. Of course, today won't be for him. And all of the sprinters are probably thinking of getting round, not to Paris though, to Nice. For the final time trial, there's less of an incentive for a sprinter to stick in the race. And we have seen that. Because here are the withdrawals ahead of today's stage. Phil Bauhaus of Bahrain Victorious is the first sprinter to go after the final sprint stage. And he's been followed by Jaco Alula, lead out man, Elmar Reinders. So Bauhaus for Bahrain, his tour is over. And it's not been a bad tour. I wouldn't say it's been his best by any means for Phil Bauhaus. Finished second actually yesterday behind Jasper Philipson with Christoph in third. So did finish on a high. But that's been his only podium position at this Tour de France. I recall him having a much better tour last year where he was on the podium multiple times. So this has been a slight regression for Phil Bauhaus. But still, a good way to end off your tour. And Elmar Reinders could have been a useful tug buddy for the likes of Christopher Udell Jensen or Simon Yates. To get into the breakaway, Michael Matthews as well you could have potentially had for a day like today. Slightly similar to the stage he won, was it last year or two years ago? But here we go, Lotto Destiny have kicked off the attacking once more. Garang Thomas follows it for the Ineos Grenadiers. And for the moment, nobody else has reacted, but DSM, Fernick, Postenel now begin a two-rider attack on the right-hand side of the road. Sebastian Grignard is the instigator of all of this for Lotto Destiny. And he finds himself in a breakaway with a Tour de France champion. Visma Lisa Biker trying to propel a rider up the road as well. He's clinging on to the rear of the attack led by DSM, Fernick, which has now formed a chase group of six riders and once again now riders are pinging off of the front of the peloton and this is where you will see the breakaway form I suspect I think UAE are trying to get involved in the breakaway as well now that they've seen a Visma Lisa bike rider up the road looks like Nils Pollitt Maybe Tim Wellens as well, one of the flat rulers. As Grignard and Geraint Thomas continue their foray at the front of the race. But the amount of riders that have tried to get themselves off the front has just meant that the peloton has strung out and caught Grignard and Geraint Thomas. Ben Healy is towards the front as well for EF, Education, Easy Post. He's going to fancy a sniff at today, you'd suspect. Rui Costa is there as well as an important teammate. Somebody who seemingly won't be there for Israel Premier Tech is Stephen Williams. He's towards the rear of the peloton. Ben Healy is trying to close a gap to an Uno X attacker. And on the left-hand side, Wout van Aert goes. He's followed by a Lotto Destiny rider. Looks like Drizners for Lotto Destiny following that wheel. A cross tries to ping Harold Tejada. And he makes it onto the rear of the Lotto Destiny rider. Uno X are trying to make themselves involved in this breakaway as well. Trying to get across at the moment, it is three riders at the front of the race. One chaser from the Uno X Mobility team. That is Tobias Harland, Johannesson, I think. But Wout van Aert has ripped a group away from the front of the race. I think all four of them were expecting more riders to follow. But for now, there is no response, but... Here we go, another chase group starting to form. The rider from Uno X, Harlan Johansson, 
has made his way onto the back of this group of three. And we've got chase groups that are starting to form. Riders are happy with a large chase group that have just dislodged themselves from the front of the peloton. But it looks like it's Visma Lisa bike trying to chase them down. Van Aert, Drizners, Tejada, and Johannesson up the road. That was a great call from me on Drizners. Of course, Drizners had a pretty horrific accident at last year's UAE tour. Flying into one of the barriers there, so it's been an immense recovery and improvement even to get to the Tour de France for Lotto Destiny. Been involved in the lead outs for Arno Delete on sprint stages. But at the moment, our group of four have just under 10 seconds gap on the peloton. So this is our first breakaway of the day. And it looks like they're at least going to stick it out. They'll want to be joined, I'm sure, by many more riders. But for now, we have our first breakaway group. Armour FDJ trying to get up the road, as are, is Ben Healy for EF. But at the moment, they're going up the road in ones and twos, trying to catch a group of four. Two very good riders on the flat in Van Aert and Drizners. Important domestiques for their given teams. Harold Tejada is Astana's mountain leader. And Johannesson is the same, but for Uno X. Johannesson as well, a rider who was involved in the Plateau de Bay stage from the breakaway that was eventually reeled in. That included the likes of Jai Hindley and Richard Carapaz and Lawrence de Plus as well. Tejada stuck with the GC group for a while on stage 15. So does have good climbing legs at the moment, as it is Valentin Madwa and Ben Healy in the chase group. So the leading four have 15 seconds on the peloton. And we have a breakaway that has formed at the very least. Madwa and Healy are trying to chase them down. But at the moment, it's four against two. There are two good riders in Healy and Madwa. Very good classics riders on their day. But I'm not sure whether they can catch Van Aert, Drizners, Tejada and Johannesson on their own. Tejada has been with Astana for many years now and is one of the few pure climbers on that team been with them six, since 2020 after joining from the Colombian continental scene and is starting to enter the sort of prime years of his career now at 27 Van Aert needs no introduction at all. Is without a stage win at this Tour de France. Has come very close though before two second places in consecutive stages on stage 12 and 13. But is yet to add to the nine stages that he has already won at this race. And he's looking to move himself into double figures. I am sure of that. As three riders have just gone on an attack. With Jan here towards the back of the peloton for now. And it's led by Movistar. EF are also involved as well as Alpacin de Koenig, I think. But Movistar clearly want a rider in this group. Madwa and Healy have been caught by the peloton. And it is Alpacid de Koenig with EF, but they're trying to hold on to this Movistar rider's wheel. Or catch up to it, should I say. And 
this at the moment is pulling this group of four at the head of the race back because of the amount of riders that want to attack in the peloton. And the race might accidentally self-neutralize because the gap has suddenly closed drastically. More attacks flying off the front. Lotto Destiny trying to get involved as well as Ineos Grenadiers. The chasing group of three have now been reeled in. So that was in vain from Movistar. As Lotto Destiny try and get another rider in the move. They're not happy with just Jared Drisners, and that makes sense. They've lost Maxim Van Hills, of course, at this race, which means their only real hill rider is Harm Van Halke. Kampenarts and Van Moor are good on the classic stages, but perhaps a stage like this is a little too uphill and hard for them. As Sylvain Dillier is off the back, that's a key domestique in the green jersey battle for Jasper Philipson. He's clinging on to the back of the Ineos Grenadiers car at the moment. But Dillier dropped. A rider who spends a lot of his time on the front of the peloton monitoring the breakaway is struggling to follow after the breakaway has gone today. 143.2 kilometers remain in the day. 10 seconds is the advantage to the leading group of four on the peloton. And it's a peloton for the moment led by Red Bull Bora Hanskara. They want riders in the breakaway. And at the moment, they've got none. So a lot of teams have missed this move. At the moment, Van Aert, Drisner, Tejada and Johannesson are doing a lot of effort to keep this group away. But they'd happily keep the group away if they're joined by riders. They've got a guaranteed ticket to the breakaway if they do so. And it's EF who are trying to pull this one within range for an attack by one of their riders. Jasper Philipson is off the back of the peloton, but doesn't seem too phased. Of course, second in the green jersey classification. Within range of Biniam Gilmai, but Gilmai looks okay after his crash yesterday. We'll see whether he is by the time we reach Vain. Tobias Johannesson takes a turn at the front, hands over. Pacing duties to Harold Tejada, and we've got an attack from Ben Healy, trying to bridge a chase group to the front of the race. He's certainly bridged to the front of the race, but he's bridged the whole peloton with him. As Tejada attacks on the right-hand side of the road, he uses the dividers in the road to his advantage, but is reeled in once more by Ben Healy. A rider who is a little bit awkward when it comes to getting into the breakaway. Does a lot of effort and does find himself in the breakaway, but because of the amount of effort he does, he can rarely turn it into a victory despite being an incredibly talented rider. Today looks like a stage for him. So if he can get the tactics correct and save his energy, he will be a good shout for today. However, all he's done at the moment is catch the original group of four who were off the front. That was Wild Van Aert, Jared Drisners, Harold Tejada, and Tobias Harland Johannesson. The moves begin once more, and it's Ben Healy that's trying to force it. He's been on the front of the peloton for a long time now. But he has done the square root of nothing. Towards the back of the peloton at the moment is Jan Hirt. He's got FDJ's Luxembourg champion Kevin Genietz alongside him. Nestled in towards the back is Mark Cavendish. And gradually moving his way up into the middle of the peloton. 
is Binny Mgilmai. He's got one teammate constantly scanning over his shoulder and looking for him. That's Lawrence Rex. But right at the back for Decathlon Azure Desert is their GC leader, Felix Jal, currently 11th overall. And he's a rider that likes to sit on the back, but it's probably not a good time, especially when the breakaways are going like this. Arkea Bambil tells have instigated the attacking once more, followed by Jaco Alula and Lotto Destiny. And they've ripped a group of three away from the peloton, but the peloton is not happy. They want riders in the breakaway more from more of the teams. It looked like Kevin Vorkalam was the Arkea BMB Tolls rider to attack. And if so, that's a great job from him. After being caught behind early on in a split in the crosswinds. Christopher Yuli Jensen is in there as well. He's the Jaco Alula rider involved in the breakaway. Lotto Destiny in there as well. So once again, it's kicked off. As we've done over three quarters of an hour in this race, no breakaway has properly formed yet. We thought we had one after a group of four led the way. But they were reeled in by Ben Healy. But it was a, f a, f a very boring day yesterday, got to be honest with you. And it's been already been trumped in drama by today's stage. We've had crosswinds, we've had breakaway battles, which are still ongoing. But the day was won by Jasper Philipson, and here's what he had to say yesterday. At the end of the stage, Philipson said, I'm really happy after such a team effort. It's always nice when you can win together. I think that's definitely what we did today. We were always together with our team and trying to position ourselves. We were focusing on our own lead out and I didn't see any crash. I hope everybody's okay. I was feeling good. I had a good rest day and was feeling my shape improve during this Tour de France. So I was confident that if we could line it up well today, then we could go for the win. Every stage win is really hard to get, especially at this level. So to take three is a really good job and I think we can be proud. Everything is possible, but it's really hard to get the green jersey. Binium Gomai is climbing really well. I just hope he's okay after the crash because he doesn't deserve to lose like this, but I'll just try whenever we can. The hard stages are yet to come, so we go day by day, but we also mostly enjoy this win. So Philipson has half an eye on the green jersey at the very least, but he's going to revel in a stage victory from yesterday. We've already seen him marking Binyam Gilmai during the stage. Both of them have been off the back at similar times, which says a lot. As Jaco Alula and FGJ are just coming to the front of the convoy to help riders who need some assistance. And it is FDJ who are lighting it up at the front of the peloton, of course. Roman Gregoire attacking away from the peloton, or at least trying to, for the French team. And we've done around 40 kilometers of the day, which means just under 138 to go on the stage into Super Devoli. Verona off the back of the Peloton for Little Trek. You'd expect he'd be given a free roll to go for the day, but of course he's got to protect Giulio Ciccone and his eighth position overall. This could be a day for Tom Scroins as well if he's on real climbing form and has the legs for it. Loves himself a long, hard day in the saddle. But at the moment, it's Clément Rousseau 
that's trying to force a group away. He looks over his shoulder, sees that the group has not gone with Nielsen Paulus in it as well for EF Education Easy Post and Rasmus Tiller there as well, Bruno X, and slightly gives up on it. He increases the pace though after freewheeling, trying to get away. T Tiller is trying to pull Tobias Harlan Johansson into a breakaway. They're going with the two up attack system. Simon Geschke is following as well as Wout Van Aert. Of course, Van Aert and Johansson have already been involved in a move that has gone off the front today. But that was reeled in by Ben Healy. As Group Armour FDJ are towards the back. One of the riders on bottle duty, Valentin Madouat, hands one over to Kevin Giniets. And Lenny Martinez as well is towards the back for the French lottery funded side. As two of the other French teams launch a move off of the front, Simon Geschke, the German on Cofidis, is the main instigator. He's followed by Arkea BNB Hotels. Nielsen Paula slots onto the wheel as well. And Visma Lisa Bike are very keen on getting a rider into the breakaway. They are incredibly keen on getting a rider into the early move. Of course, it gives you more tactical options during the race. And it might worry UAE Team Emirates, depending on who they get into the move. But at the moment, a big breakaway has been forced off the front. One rider's let go of the wheel and a gap has formed. And suddenly, this is a large group that have made their way off the front of the peloton. We're about to get a team radio from Visma Lisa Bike, who have one of the riders on the front at the moment. Visma Lisa Bike is saying UAE is not trying to control. And the team car says, no, UAE is not trying to control. You are indeed correct. Matteo Jorgensen is one of the riders from Visma Lisa Bike who have made their way up the road. But it's been reeled in. The peloton especially strung out. And we've got another attack coming from Movistar. Victor Kampanas is onto the rear of that attack. A group of around six that are trying to get away from the peloton at the moment. Adam Yates is towards the rear of the peloton. Along with Joao Almeida. Ryan Gibbons there as well as Felix Gial. And Giulio Ciccone. So plenty of the GC riders don't fancy being at the front of the peloton at the moment. UAE team Emirates say we need to be more present in the front because Visma is jumping. Verona handing over bottles to Ryan Gibbons and Giulio Ciccone. And we've got three riders who have forced themselves away with a gap. Bob Jungles leads them for Red Bull Bora Hansgrohe. Tobias Harland Johansson is involved once more for Uno X. He's a rider that seems to find himself in the good breakaways fairly often, so he's a good wheel to follow. And that wheel at the moment is being followed by George Zimmerman. Never mind, it's Jonas Abrahamson. <laughs> Classic. Lotto Destiny trying to force themselves off the front as well. That's Victor Kampenarts trying to bridge back to this breakaway. He's got one rider on his wheel. And Kampenarts has done so. But he's also dragged most of the peloton along with him. Group Armour FDJ trying to get involved in the moves as well with Stefan Kuhn and David Gordou. So they led the peloton, and they've also got a rider at the back in Kevin Genietz. Arkea BMB Hotels wants a bottle to be given to Dan McClay. And once again, three riders try a move. It's three French teams. Well, three riders from French teams, should I say. Two French teams involved in it. Two riders from FDJ, Clement Rousseau is one of them. And the Arkea BMB Hotels rider trying to work that out.
but it has caused major fractions in the peloton and breakages. Riders trying to get away. Okay, Ben Bill tells now have a second rider up there. Along with Group Armor FDJ, Red Bull Bora Hansgrohe are trying to make it across as well and have done so. One Unum X rider now is in the group as well. Along with Wout Van Aert for Visma Lisa Bike. So it's a strong group and one that riders do not want to miss. Geraint Thomas at the moment is closing this one for the Ineos Grenadiers. Who don't have any rider in this breakaway for now. And Thomas has closed. So with 131.7 kilometers to go, the peloton is still all together. Wout van Aert is the next rider to give it a go. And has got a gap, used the road divider to his advantage and has found himself with a small gap on a chasing group of two riders Uno X and Ineos Grenadiers with Geraint Thomas. Then two more riders have joined them from Sudal Quickstep and DSM Fermanick Post NL respectively. And that group of four are going to make their way onto the rear wheel of Wild Van Aert to become five. Alexei Lutsenko towards the back of the peloton along with Sam Bennett. Also there for Lotto Destiny is Jared Drisners, a rider who has already been involved in a breakaway with Wild Van Aert. And Wild Van Aert is up the road again today. But for the moment, he's not found himself there with enough of a gap. And once again, the move is reeled in by the peloton. Who will be next to instigate things at the moment it's Movistar and they are followed by Total Energy who go for an attack off the front of the peloton so will this be the one to go we've been racing for nearly an hour now we've done over 45 kilometers on the road and we are yet to see a breakaway It's just over 50 kilometers before the intermediate sprint in vain. About 65 to go until we reach that point. So I think in around 40 kilometers, if there is still no breakaway, and I'd say that's a big if based on how the Peloton has raced today, then the sprinters teams will want to get involved. I'm just going to have a little bit of scran, um, so I'm going to mute up. It's not going to turn into a ASMR stream as Tratnik requires some assistance from the Visma Lisa White team car. I chose a good time to eat because there is still no formulated breakaway up the road. I've not missed the move going. 
and we've done an hour now in this race. I'm not sure how far into the race Tomagashi Nar went yesterday. As Ineos have sent Jonathan Castro Viejo and Gerard Thomas up the road in an attempt to try and get themselves a stage win. Of course, the Grenadiers are without a stage for the moment. Their best result has been provided by a rider who isn't in this race anymore, which is the Brit Tom Pidcock, who got second place on stage nine behind Anthony Turgis in the gravel stage. But a rather large group finds themselves off the front of the peloton at the moment. And it includes the likes of American champion Sean Quinn, Guy Thomas and Jonathan Castro Viejo. Warren Barguiz in there for DSM Fermanich Postenel. As well as that looks like Jai Hindley for Bora Hanskra, who finds himself in the move. But it has once again been reeled in by the Peloton for now. They're going to continue to press on though at the front. To try and force another gap and another breakaway. And this is not a good sign for the likes of Jared Drizners. And Alexei Lutsenko who are towards the back and have been for this whole race. Alexei Lutsenko especially so. Has been caught behind on his own in splits in the crosswinds earlier on today. But Ben Healy's next to launch. And he's followed very closely by a rider from Arkea B&B Hotels who sees a small gap opening in front of him and goes for it. Dorian Godon trying to get onto the wheel of the Arkea rider. But we've got another attack from Visma Lisa Bike. As one of the riders from Kofidis is dropped. I think that's Axel Zandler. Could be wrong. I just missed the number. Luke Durbridge towards the front. Probably trying to propel Chris Juliansen or Yates into a breakaway. As Total Energy spark up the attacking once more. It's Matteo Verche that's doing it. But at the moment, nothing is coming to fruition for the breakaway riders. Group Armour FDJ trying to force one off the front as well at the moment. Straight after the Verche attack. Everything is strung out. As Kevin Genietz requires assistance from the medical car. So that's the reason why he's been towards the back all day. Another rider who has been towards the back of the peloton for the vast majority of the day has been Adam Yates. He's still there. But Uno X now find themselves with one rider off of the front of the peloton. And away at the head of the race. He's about to be joined up by a group that includes the likes of Christophe Laporte and Alex Aramburu. Ben Healy as well is in there for EF Easy Post. And Movistar have a teammate of Aramburu's in the breakaway too. But that's been reeled in. So Aaron Buru kicks once more. Onto the wheel goes Ben Healy. And the gaps are starting to form in the peloton. Little cracks after riders pull off. But Aaron Buru looks behind. Ben Healy reluctant to take a turn. And that is reeled in once more. So still no breakaway is gone. We've been going now for well over an hour. And it's not without the want of trying. It's just nothing has come to fruition yet for the riders that want a stage win from the breakaway. One of which is Wart Van Aert, 
who sparks up yet another move. Following the wheel is Lazcano, and on his wheel is Harold Tejada, two riders who have been in the breakaway before, and that's a badly timed mechanical for Alexei Lutsenko of Astana. Is it a mechanical, or is it a call for withdrawal from Alexei Lutsenko? And it looks like it's the latter. The head unit has been removed from the bike. And Lutsenko is about to enter the team car. The back door is open. And Lutsenko with both hands on his head. He looks distraught. And he's not going to finish this race. For Astana Kazakhstan, so I was worried that he was the first man to be dropped, and rightly so, because he's clearly nursing a problem. And he's going to have to call it quits for this Tour de France. Abandonment then for Alexei Lutsenko, and he is the first rider during the stage to have called it today. That's all then for Lutsenko, the helmet's off. He's being consoled by his team. Mark Renshaw being one of them. So Lutsenko has abandoned the race, but attention will switch to Harold Tejada, who's tried to get involved into multiple breakaways today. Once again, none of them have gone. There's Tobias Harlan Johannesson, another rider who's been incredibly active. Hands over to Ben Healy, who launches one more time. At the moment, followed by Group Armour FGJ, and suddenly we have a group that has formed. Two Uno X riders involved, two Red Bull Bora Hansgrohe riders involved, and it looks like a group of 10 or so have made their way off the front, following the wheel of Ben Healy who is just an infinite power glitch at this point. Two Israel Premier Tech riders towards the rear of the peloton. And one of those is Derek G, which doesn't fill me with confidence. Jake Stewart is sat on the wheel of the Canadian. But G, very highly positioned in the general classification, sat ninth, is on the rear of the peloton. Felix Gal likes to be there, which is why I'm not phased whenever he's towards the back, but Derek G worries me greatly that he's towards the rear of the peloton. But this group of 10 or so that I was on about has suddenly got much, much bigger. We've got chase groups that are trying to make their way across. Will this be the breakaway that does go? There is a clear gap between them and the peloton now. And there are plenty of riders in the group. It's whether they all want to work together to try and achieve this breakaway getting off the front. Bobby Ungors is there for Bora Hanskra. Danny Van Poppel there as well for that team. Visma Lisa Bike have got one rider into the move at the very least. But at the moment, the move is being tracked by many, many riders. So many riders want to get into the breakaway. And I think that partially has effects of previous sprint stages where nobody's wanted to. And suddenly now on these hillier terrains, so many riders want to get into the breakaway that actually they all neutralise one another. But now we've got a group forced off the front by Red Bull Bora Hansgrohe. Magnus Court is involved in it and just takes a turn on the front now. There's a Group Armour FGJ rider on his wheel. And once again, Visma Lisa Bike are present in the breakaway. So they've been on the offensive throughout today. Tish Banut is the Visma Lisa Bike rider that is involved. And it's a group of four riders after Danny Van Poppel calls it quits. So he's done all he can to get Bobby Jungles to the front of the race, and Jungles has got to the front of the race. We saw him force the breakaway off the front on stage 15, and he's doing that once again today. 
in a group that includes Tish Benut, Magnus Court, and Roman Gregoire. So Gregoire, Court, Jungles, and Benot are off the front at the moment. I'm not sure a lot of teams will be happy with this. They have missed this move. And once again, we see a group of four off the front. It was Drizners, Tejada, Johannesson, and Wild Van Aert before. Visma Lisa Vike have got themselves in this move once again, this time with a different rider, Benot. And Bob Jungles has found himself in this move as well. For Red Bull Bora Hansgrohe, formerly would be involved in the Primoz Roglic mountain train. But now they're a team that are gunning for stage wins and Bob Jungles is going to be a key rider in that. And for the moment, he's done his job because there is a decent gap between the front of the race and the peloton. The TV pictures say eight seconds. I'd be inclined to say more. And the gap is growing now. Ten seconds between the head of the race and the peloton. But the fact there's only four means that this is a very controllable breakaway if you're involved in the teams hunting for a stage win with a GC guy. Cough, cough, UAE. So Group Armour FGJ have all of their teams still in the race. But at the moment, Roman Gregoire is their only rider that has made it off of the front of the peloton. We've seen him involved in attacks before on this stage, trying to force groups away. This time he's clung onto the wheel of Bobby Ungles and found himself in a leading group. Nobody in here higher than 40th overall, which is reserved for Bob Jungles at 1 hour and 54 minutes down. So this is by no means troubling the top 10 of the general classification. But they look to have found themselves with a gap. Somebody who could tell us what might happen from the GC groups is UAE Team Emirates Head of Performance, Machine, who says it's important to remain in the yellow jersey come next Sunday. It will take work, focus, respecting the rivals and continuing in this way. We don't take any risks with Adam Yates. We abide by the new rules of wearing masks at every moment. He has little problems, but no COVID. There were reports yesterday that Yates arrived in a separate car to the rest of the UAE Team Emirates team. The same went with Tim Wellens. So perhaps he's feeling that towards the back of the peloton today. As the breakaway has 20 seconds lead on the peloton. Machine went on to say he has a high temperature, does Adam Yates, but he's not sick or COVID positive. It's a stage, in my opinion, that should go to the breakaway. It will be a complicated process with a lot of riders wanting to enter this breakaway. Whether it's better for Tadej Pogacar or Jonas Vingegaard depends on the level of both of them. For example, the day in the massive Sontral is better for Jonas and Sunday was better for Tadej. It's complicated for all of us. Obviously, the last week is more complicated after arriving tired. It's not ending in Paris this year. It ends with a complicated time trial, and therefore, this week is really important and hard. I will cross my fingers and hope it's better for us than Visma Lisa Bike. So that was the view of Machin. He expects a breakaway to go and take the stage win, but also expects a KG stage between Jonas Vingegaard and Tade Pogaccia. And it will be worth keeping an eye on Adam Yates. Not COVID. Seemingly got himself a temperature at the moment, high temperature, but no sickness. So on a day like today where the sun is shining and it is quite hot, will he be able to cling on 
to the rear of the peloton and get himself involved by the time the race gets to the climbs of the Col Bayard, the Col de Noyer and Super de Vully. And a man who was involved in many a breakaway last year, been a bit quiet on today's, uh, today's, this year's Tour de France, Chris Nylans, former Latvian champion of course, which is why he wears the bands on the arms, tried an attack at the moment, we're looking at the Spanish national champion, Alex Aramburu, who's gone off the front on his own. And multiple riders are following, but one of those is Biniam Diamai. Diamai trying to get himself into a breakaway to seal the sprint points at Vane. He's followed by one rider from Little Trek, another rider from Cofidis, trying to move up. But this is a good sign for the Eritrean that he's in good form and has good legs. Marc Soler is off the back, complains to the motorbike that he's been shown. And he's been a rider that's been towards the back all day. We're starting to see riders that clearly have problems during this Tour de France. Jared Drisner's has been involved in the breakaway and I think is starting to suffer from that. He's been off the back of the peloton, or towards the rear of the peloton, should I say, ever since. As we've got a two-rider chase route that now forms, Lawrence Rex is one of them. And he's alongside a Visma Lisa bike rider, so Visma trying to get another rider into the breakaway alongside Teish Benoit. UAE are following this one with Nils Pollitt. And it looks like that's going to self-neutralise. But we still have four riders away at the head of the race. Tish Benoit, Bob Jungles, Roman Gregoire and Magnus Kort. Of course, the blue moustache now sported by the Dane on Uno X. And they've got 40 seconds over the peloton. So after all of this attacking... All of the different groups that have tried to force themselves off the front. We've seen Ben Healy be a protagonist. We've seen Tobias Harlan Johannesson be a protagonist. We've seen Wout van Aert as well get involved in many a move. None of them have made it into the leading group for now. Bart Lemon was the rider with Lawrence Rex. And EF know that they've missed this. They've got Sean Quinn in the American National Champions jersey to the front. And they're trying to close this one down to get Healy into the breakaway. Attack now on the left-hand side by Bahrain Victorious. Followed by Jaco Alula and Michael Matthews. Alberson de Koenig also trying to get representation up the road. And they go for a counter-attack. The rider is away on his own for now. As Decathlon as you desire, tried to close this one down alongside Wout van Aert, who has ripped a group of five away. And he's joining up with Axel Laurence of Alpacin de Koenig. One of the Uno X riders currently in a bit of a chasse patat, trying to make it across as Sam Bennett has pulled the plug. The elastic has snapped between him and the peloton and the legs have snapped as well. So Bennett's struggling, he's off the rear of the peloton, as one of the EF riders just latches back on. With a bunch of feed bags and musettes to hand out amongst his teammates. Gaviria is towards the rear of the peloton for Movistar. Clinging on at the moment, we've seen him off the back early on. In the Italian stages, alongside Mark Cavendish and Fabio Jakobsen then. Two of those three are in the race. With Fabio Jakobsen getting into the car midway through this Tour de France because of illness. And he's been part of a DSM team that have lost a couple of riders. Throughout this Tour de France, luckily both of them have been in their sprint train 
Bram Velton is the other rider, a fellow Dutchman. But the gap to the front four is 45 seconds. Sam Bennett is now over a minute down. But it's not going to stop riders continuing to attack at the head of the peloton. Intermarche Wanty trying to pull somebody into the breakaway. Nils Pollitt following and now coming to the front of the peloton. Antony Turgi sat quite nicely around 10th wheel for Total Energy. Of course, a rider who's already won a stage at this Tour de France on the gravel. Helped by a important turn by Alexei Lutsenko, somebody who has ended up abandoning the race today. Hopefully Kevin Juniat stays in because I'm a big fan of his work. He's having a word with the medical assistance car. But is back onto the rear of the peloton. As we enter the Departement de Haute Alpe, and we are into the mountainous regions. We will go into the mountains much later on in the stage. But for now, we're in the right region. And we've got four riders that lead the way. Benelux represented by Tish Benut and Bob Jungles. France represented by Roman Gregoire in their home Grand Tour. And Magnus Court representing Scandinavia for Denmark and Uno X. He's been a rider that's been very vocal about the lack of breakaways recently, along with Matej Mohoric. Proposed some potential solutions. Uh, Julian Bernard tries to get himself involved in the breakaway as well. At the moment, he's only dragged the rest of the peloton along with him. That includes the likes of Christophe Laporte. And here goes Stevie Williams. So a rider who's been towards the back is fresh and hasn't been involved in too many of the attacks. Just sat towards the rear of the peloton, waiting for his moment to go. And the freshness of the Brit has forced a gap and he is away on his own for now. Trying to be followed by DSM Fernie Postenel for the moment. And they've got a group that's formed itself away from the peloton. Williams tries to press on. Neos Grenadiers looking to close this one down. But Williams is still away on his own at the front of the race. As we are in the Alpe Côte d'Azur province. And it is a large group now that is formed behind Stevie Williams. But will that group cooperate with one another? Or will the peloton not be happy and reel them in? This is the point at which the road first properly goes uphill as well. So we will start to see more attacks from the Hillier specialists. Stephen Williams, of course, being one of them. So that might be where we see the majority of the breakaway form. And it's Oyel Azcano who is hitting out at the moment for Movistar. He's followed by EF Education Easy Post and Richard Carapaz. Following Carapaz is the Jaco Alula rider. I think that's Simon Yates. And Yates is trying to force this group away from the peloton. For now, that is not happening. As Ineos close it, along with DSM Fermanic Postenel. Ineos have actually got their rider across into this chase. And the gap is slowly opening to the DSM Fermanic Postenel rider at the front of the peloton. And because of all this action, the gap has closed to within 30 seconds of the breakaway group. 
Sam Bennett struggling off the back. Over two minutes down now is the rider from Decathlon Azure Desert. They've just flicked the camera back to him. Doesn't seem to require any medical assistance, just struggling with the legs. Seventy one kilometres have been done today. And we've gone at nearly fifty kilometres an hour on average. That's gonna slow down now they're hitting the steeper percentages. But it's gonna mean that a breakaway goes, you'd suspect. And at the moment it's Richard Carapaz that is hitting out for EF Easy Post. Followed by Simon Yates, so this is two incredibly talented climbers. That are away. Two riders who have been to the forefront in Tour de France general classifications in previous years. At the moment find themselves cast adrift from the top 10. And are looking for a stage win. You'd argue that these two are amongst the most elite climbers in the race. That have nothing to play for overall. So these are two riders that are going to dominate you'd suspect on the final three climbs if they make it into the breakaway and that breakaway goes the distance. They've got 26 seconds to catch up to the group of four up the road for the moment, which is Teish Benoit, Bob Jungles, Roman Gregoire and Magnus Court. But Carapaz and Yates have been caught by a rider from Movistar, looks like Lascano, who is not a bad rider at all to have with you. A real engine who's had a breakout last couple of years. Sam Bennett is riding alone. He's been distanced now by the convoy and it looks like a trip to the broom wagon might be imminent for the Irishman on Decathlon Azure Desert. La Mondiale. He looks defeated, and it may be our second abandon of the day. He could be joining Alexei Lutsenko as two riders who have been swept up by the broom wagon. Lutsenko's been off the back all day. Bruno Armirai was the other rider to have been dropped on his own in the crosswinds, but we've not heard anything from him regarding an abandonment. However, his Decathlon Azure Desert Le Mondial teammate Sam Bennett looks like the next one to go as we enter the town of Rosan. Of course, Magnus Court, stage winner on stage two of the Criterium de Dauphiné last year. Bobby Ungles has won a stage at the Tour de France, Teich Benoit. His best victory came at Strada Bianchi. That was back in 2018 when he was on Lotto Sudal at the time. And Roman Gregoire is a rider who is just beginning to formulate a career for himself. An exciting French talent, only 21 years old, remember. Who had a breakout year last year, winning the four days of Dunkirk and the Tour de Limousin. And now he is beginning to branch out from the French races, winning a stage at the Tour of the Basque Country this year, ahead of all Luis Aulard and Max Schackerman. And that was a race that had a critical impact on many of the Peloton and many of the GC favourites for this race. Of course, Jonas Vingegaard, the main talking point, he was involved in a crash that included the likes of Primoz Roglic and Remco Evenepoel. Jay Vine is still struggling after that crash, but is slowly on the road back to getting onto the bike. He was the worst affected by that incident. And there is no Australian representation in the breakaway for now. Jacob Alula have tried. I'm sure they will make it up, I suspect. 
with Simon Yates. Although he's not Australian. Part of the Australian team though, so I'll I'll half give him that. Luke Durbridge, of course, has been towards the front. Has Kwiatkowski, Hage and Madwas, as well as Sean Quinn. Have joined up with this Lazcano, Yates and Carapaz group. Zimmerman there as well. But a rider who will just want be wanting to finish this day is Mark Cavendish. He was talking at the end of yesterday's stage and ended up missing out on the chance at going for victory in the sprint. But he didn't seem too down when he was given multiple questions. Finished outside the top 15 on the day, but here's what he had to say. We were pretty well positioned coming into the final. There's a lot of teams that had it together today, and you could really see that. With some of those roundabouts, if you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, you lose momentum, and that's it. Some guys get through and go for it, whereas other guys don't. I heard some guys go down. I think Biniam Jomai maybe came down. The most important thing is that they're okay, and everyone's through safely. Somebody's got to win. A lot of people have to lose. I haven't seen much. I've just seen a little clip. It looks like Alpacin got it quite perfectly with Mathieu van der Poel and Jasper Philipsen again, so congratulations to them. In the final, we could only go on one side of each roundabout anyway, so everybody has the same idea. There's only a certain bit of road. You get it right sometimes. You don't get it right sometimes. That's the nature of it. I'm happy. We did what we set out to achieve here at the Tour de France. We did it early on, so we're happy it's been successful. Everything on top of the fifth stage would just be a bonus for us, so we try. We tried to get through, we tried to sprint, we tried with Harold Tejada in the mountains, and we'll try to get to Nice. I'll cherish the moment as much as I can in the Alpmarie team, it's hard around there. I've trained for a fair bit there, but we ride as a unit and we tried to get through. I think Harold and Lutz, unfortunate, are our guys for those mountain days. Hopefully they can do something. Harold was with the favourites on Sunday for quite a long time, so the pressure is off for us sprinters, really. It's just about riding the rest of the kilometres there and try and do it within a certain time of what the leaders get there in. 103 kilometres to go, just under. And we now have a formulated chase group. Yates and Carapaz not involved in that chase as Dan McClay is getting shelled off the back of the peloton. Who are only 40 seconds behind the front group of four. Tish Benoit, Bob Jungles, Roman Gregoire and Magnus Court. And we've had our second abandonment of the day. Fernando Gaviria of Movistar has called it quits on his Tour de France. So joins a let's say Lutsenko in the back of the broom wagon of today's stage. Just off the back of the peloton there, trying to make their way back on and clinging to the rear of the cars was Nico Dens. And trying to cling on to the back of the peloton at the moment is Han van Holker. A rider who I expected would be involved on, on a day like this. But the gap is closing to the breakaway. Sam Bennett is now being followed by the broom wagon, and this might be it for the Decathlon Age d'Azur rider. I think we're about to see him abandon the race, but the race stays on, and especially so for the front group of four. Teich Benoit, Bob Jungles, Roman Gregoire and Magnus Court Nielsen. 26 seconds to the peloton that includes Jonas Vingidor, Tadej Pogacar and Remco Evenepoel. As well as Binium Diomai. As Frank Vandenbroek requires some assistance from the DSM Fernick Post NL team car. We've got a chase group that has now formed off of the front of the peloton. And the rider that's forced it away is Christophe Laporte. He's followed by Jai Hindley. 
So Rebel Bore Hanskra, if they can get Jai Hin Lee in this move with Bob Yungles, that is a deadly duo that they can use on the three mountains that bookend the day. Julianson is towards the rear of the peloton looking for assistance from the Jaco Alula team car. Fellow Dane of Magnus Court who finds himself in the breakaway. And we've got right plenty of team leaders getting involved in these breakaway moves now. Steph Krass, who we saw off the back very early on for Total Energy, is trying to get into a breakaway along with Dion Martin who was a master of doing this when he was involved in general classification hunts a couple of years ago. But for now, he's missed the key move that have gone off the front of the race. Quite a long time ago now, Tish Benoit, Bobby Undraws, Roman Gregoire and Magnus Court, they lead the way. But what composition of chase group will make it across to them? Will the chase group make it across? And if they don't, can any of the teams of Alpha Cinder Koenig and Intermarche Wanty get involved in a sprint for Binium Diomai or Jasper Philipson? At the moment, this raising gradient on the road has forced many riders off the back of the peloton. And we have a drastically thinned main group on the road. George Zimmerman is one of the riders in it, as is Tade Pogaccia in the yellow jersey. Julian Bernard there as well. Matteo Jorgensen has Visma Lisa White teammates Jonas Vingegaard with him. That will be his main idea of the day. Bart Lemon is there as well for Visma Lisa Bike. A rider who, of course, was forced in to the team last minute after the late change because of COVID for Sepkus. How Visma Lisa Bike have missed Sepkus this year. But that is all for Sam Bennett. He has abandoned the race, so that is our third abandonment of the day, our second sprint abandonment of the day. Phil Bauhaus didn't start today, so you can perhaps add that to the list. Fernando Gaviria and Sam Bennett have abandoned during this stage. And the peloton is drastically thinned and is lined out at the moment. And it's been a day that has not really stopped at all. with just over 99 kilometers remaining. We've done 79 kilometers of the day, and we've only got a breakaway group that has 26 seconds over the yellow jersey. If that is the chase group, then it is rather large that is following the breakaway at the moment. But it might be the peloton, it's that large. Replay of Sam Bennett's abandonment, a shake of the head, and a word on the radio. And that was that for Sam Bennett's Tour de France. Bennett, who I don't think has been too bad at this tour. I didn't expect much from him, but to be involved in a couple of the sprints, finish fourth, on yesterday's stage, sixth on stage 10 as well, is not a bad result for Sam Bennett, but he was always there or thereabouts in the intermediate sprints and the stage finishes on flat terrain. You thought I stopped doing this live stream? Nice. Um, yeah, I, I kind of only do it on days when I'm free, which is kind of here and there, like... I don't really have any set schedule for this. What's my opinion on the performance of Pogaccia? Loads of people are saying doping. I don't believe that. Um, I think it's... And this is my 
way with all of cycling, I think. It's okay to have that scepticism, and I think it's healthy to have that scepticism. Um, but I, I'm not the type to, to cry doping whenever there's any good performance. Like, the amount of riders that did the performances that they, they did um, and the comparisons with, with Pantani and all of that um, don't do it much good. I've got a friend that, that does those kind of calculations and it's probably the one that you've you've seen if you've seen any of them. Um, so I, I don't think his methodology is wrong in any way. But yeah, I think it's okay to have that healthy scepticism, but I think people sometimes go over the top with it. Um, I still believe it, but I'm not like totally 100% just because that's the way I am, like, you know, even if one of the riders I like, heck, Chris Nylans wins a stage and goes absolutely crazy, I'll be like, okay, yeah, that's sick for him, and, you know, I like that, but I think you've got to feel that way in all sports now. So, yeah, it's a really difficult area to tread, I think, um, and I probably haven't sounded very concise with my opinion but yeah it's a, it's a difficult issue and um i think you've got to tread carefully around it as we've got an attack from guillaume martin from the yellow jersey group he's been followed by julian bernard matteo jorgensen is there as well for visma lisa bike and has found himself in this move Many, many riders trying to get off the front, and Tadej Pogacar is one of them. He's following an attack for now, so I wonder what has happened to cause that. Jonas Vingegaard is on the chase. He's latched onto the wheel of Sean Quinn, so Pogacar's instigated that from the GC group. And this has suddenly got very intriguing. Pogacar has now lost the wheel of multiple teammates, one of which being Joao Almeida. And Jorgensen and Tishbeno up the road is going to help Jonas Vingegaard if this group gets away. But it's now a GC group that is drastically thinned. And we've got a real race on our hands. I mean, it's been 82 kilometers of flat out racing, full gas racing. And once again, the pace dies down. The group of four at the front have been consistently going the same tempo for a long while. And I think that's going to help them. Even though they're taking persistent turns on the front in the wind, they've, they've been doing a consistent job and they've not had to do all these accelerations and gradual slowings and all that. So yeah... Um, Alpha, we did discuss um, Pogacar yesterday. Um, we went through kind of the whole press conference and what he was saying about like how performance has improved. And I agree with him in most areas, to be honest. Um, but yeah, I kind of exhausted myself on that. So I hope I, hope I did answer your question. Um, but yeah. Anyway, moving on. Um, a rider who found himself almost in the incident yesterday that included Biniam Giamai and Marijn Vandenberg was the Belgian national champion Arno de Lee of Lotto Destiny. He ended up not necessarily sprinting and cross rolling across the line in 27th position. But here's what he had to say at the end of the final sprint stage of this Tour de France. Delee said, I'm really happy I'm safe after this chaotic sprint. Biniam Gilmai crashes behind me, and after that I need to break. If you need to break, you lose a lot of speed. It's very difficult. I didn't crash, but I almost did, so I'm happy I'm safe. We did a good job with Victor Campanarts, Jared Drisners, and Cedric Berlins, but it was a really chaotic sprint. One time we lost the wheel, and after that it's very difficult to organise a true lead-out, so it's like that. 
Now it's time to see the finish line in Nice, and my first Tour de France will be great. It was really boring today. Everybody talked about echelons, and there was not a lot of wind. It was a boring stage, but sometimes it's like that in the Tour de France. I think everybody was happy after the last week, uh, because it was really hard. So it's an easy day, and after that, it's really hard from then on. It's also good for the legs. So the lead doesn't get a stage win in the end, but does look promising. Multiple top fives, multiple podium positions, top three. So I wouldn't say it's been a bad tour for Arno Delete. I did expect a stage win, um, but I think that was me kind of overhyping the Belgian champion. I mean, people dominating other sports, football, Messi, Ronaldo, tennis, Federer, Nadal, and Djokovic, badminton, Lindan, uh, badminton. Wow, crazy example. So why these two seem so incredible? Um, I think it's just because it's like a, such a physically demanding sport. Like it's purely down to your physique. It's the same with athletics. And I'm surprised that doesn't get the amount of um, attention that the Tour de France does. Because that is pure human effort. You know, at least with football, there's like technique and like you've got to learn skills and stuff so i can understand why there's less of that but there is like clear issues in football that they need to iron out you know stuff like they're, they're so frank about it as well with stuff like injections for players to overcome injuries um and, you know, messy taking human growth hormone and all of that. But I'm not going to get myself involved in any of that, allegedly. Um, but, yeah, I can see why there's less talking about it in stuff like football. Where... But, yeah, I'm surprised athletics doesn't get the amount of critique that cycling does. You think Visma's trying something today in terms of Jonas? I think Visma's just got to throw all of their options at the wall and hope something sticks. And that is what they are doing at the moment. Tish Benut has tried to get into moves. Bart Lemons tried to get into moves. We've seen Matteo Jorgensen on the offensive as well. EF have been the main team to have missed all of these. They've got Carapaz and Healy into breakaways on multiple occasions. None of them have gone. But here we have bikes, clothes, helmets, tyres, etc. Exactly. Yeah, that's true as well. And that is the reasoning behind Teddy Paracha. And, you know, you've got all the nutrition aspects and those elements. Um, and that was a lot of what he was talking about in his press conference. So, yeah, I'd say athletics should be the sport that gets looked upon with the most critique. But I can see why cycling does as well. I think its history doesn't help it, of course. But we do have a chase group now that has formed, and it is a group of four. If they join up, it will be a group of eight, but they've got 26 seconds to close on the breakaway. It includes Christophe Laporte, Javier Romo, and Matteo Bogado, along with Ineos Grenadiers, who have been on the offensive quite a lot today. They've managed to get the plus in the move. And now more and more riders are accelerating off of the front of the race. Simon Yates is one of them, latching on to the rear of a move. And because of how small this peloton is, they're going to be happy with letting moves go. It is a tiny, tiny peloton at the moment. Jonas Vingegaard has two teammates in the form of Bart Lemon and Wilco Kelderman. Tali Barach has got Joao Almeida with him. But this race situation is enthralling, really. So much is going on. So many riders find themselves scattered all over the road. And we've got a real race on our hands. Lawrence de Plus is up the road. He's at over half an hour down, but less than 40 minutes, so... That's a positive for him as EF fly straight past the peloton. Latching onto that move is Matteo Jorgensen. Three EF riders have launched themselves away. And it's up to UAE team Emirates who to control. 
Ineos Grenadiers doing the same. You'd expect Ben Healy to be one of those three. Did you catch how many UAEs are in the chasing group? It would be nice to see the whole Armada of Visma in front, isolating Pogacar. I want Pogacar to win the Tour, but I want things to be a lot closer. I do as well, because I was creating a montage a couple of days ago of like the best moments of the Tour and all of that. Um, probably to post on YouTube. And I was thinking about doing it on the rest day, but then the gap was kind of too big, and everybody was talking about the Tour already being over. So... I'm kind of hoping that it's unlikely but possible for Jonas to win it in the time trial, just so I can produce a bit of a hype montage. But a major, major group is getting onto the rear of the peloton now. And the peloton now is a minute and seven seconds behind the leading four riders. I don't think there are many UAE's riders in the chase um, of this group. But it is incredibly strung out in the peloton for now. And incredibly, we've already done half of this stage. Which is ridiculous. The pace has been going so quickly. And the chase group, or the majority of it, is going to be reeled in by EF Education Easy Post. They have had a stinker of a race so far. They have been so active with the likes of Ben Healy and Richard Carabaz. Marijn Vandenberg has been involved. Nielsen Paulus has found himself in moves. But none of them have found that killer move. So they are expending the team trying to get involved in the breakaway. It is indeed incredibly stretched out. Sixty-two kilometers an hour they're going at the moment. With just under eighty-six kilometers to go. And for the first time in a while, we see our leading quartet, Tish Benot, Bob Jungles, Roman Gregoire, Magnus Court Nielsen. As we approach the two hour mark, are our four riders in the lead of the race? Neutral service does not give out a water bottle to anybody. Our chase group of four have gradually been distanced. It was 25 seconds that they had to close, now it's more like 45. But our top three in GC are within four wheels of each other. Teddy Pogacar, Jonas Vingegaard and Remco Evenepoel. Pogacar leads the way. Vingegaard slots down his inside there. Remco Evenepoel trying to do similar. But we've got a much larger peloton now. This is much more usual. But how many teams are unhappy that they've not got riders into the breakaway? Uh, it doesn't seem like anything is going to happen today, though, between the top two. Yeah, I don't think it will. I think we'll be waiting for later stages for that to happen. But given how much Visma have been on the offensive, I hope something does. I just think because there is such a small gap between the peloton... And the two Visma riders of Benoit and Laporte. I don't see see any reason as to why the top two would would face off on a stage like this. So yeah, I agree with you, Alpha. Less than eighty three kilometers to go now. And UAE lead the way in the peloton, trying to chase. A couple of dangerous turns there. Quick chicane that is dealt with by the peloton. Looks like everybody stayed upright, so that's positive.
and we've got riders that are frantically chasing their way back onto the rear of the peloton which is incredibly stretched out for the moment so much action in this first whatever it is 93 kilometers and we've still got no real idea of how this race is going to play out no real idea of whether this is the eventual breakaway that forms But compared to yesterday, where there was no leeway given to the breakaway because nobody wanted to be in the breakaway, today there's no leeway being given to the breakaway because everybody wants to be in the breakaway. So totally different scenario. Fifty-eight seconds to the yellow jersey group from the head of the race 44 seconds to the chasing group of four and a certain sprinter by the name of Biniam Jamai finds himself nestled nicely into the peloton for now and that is incredibly useful for Intermarche Wanty and his green jersey hopes Because the man could pretty much seal the green jersey today. British TV have been saying he's had it all but sealed for most of this Tour de France. However, the late charge from Jasper Philipson may prove to be just about too late in the end. And I think Bini deserves it. He's had the legs throughout this Tour de France. And Philipson and the lead out have struggled to to get going once they finally have he's walked away with three stages but it took him a while to get into this Tour de France going through Seat and the peloton can see the chasing quartet who are struggling to work well together because they have imposed no damage into the leading group who have been out there for a long time now and are probably starting to struggle. But the one thing the leading group have at the moment is cooperation. And good cooperation at that. So they still remain off of the front of the peloton with less than 80 kilometres to go. Beanie deserves it for sure, absolutely. We'll do a... Um, during the time, maybe not during the time trial, but certainly after. Last year, we did a tier list of, I was going to say all of the riders at the Tour de France. Not all of them. Um, I mean, heck, we might do all of them. Why not? All 100 and whatever it is, 78 or whatever. Um, but yeah, we did a tier list of kind of the leaders of each team. Um, and we put them in, you know, S tier, A tier, B tier, whatever. Um, I can probably actually find them. We did. We definitely did the team tier list last year. Um, let me find those. So, I didn't find mine, but we did one with uh, one of my viewers, Mika, who was involved. Um, that was his tier list from last year. This was, of course, the year when Kofidis were, were going crazy. Um... So I think I had them towards the top as well. Um, so yeah, this was this was the year that Kofidis went mental. Um, so we did we did a tier list of the teams. There's Benji Narsons, by the way, um, from last year. Um, so yeah, we'll we'll do tier lists of uh, the teams, and we'll do tier lists of riders as well at the end of this Tour de France. Um, and it usually gets quite a few viewers in tier lists, so content, so. I mean, heck, maybe I was thinking about doing one of just the jersey aesthetics today, but that looks like it's uh, not going to happen, especially with how the race has been. Ineos Grenadiers just got on the radio, but I missed that uh, message. Of course, Ineos now who don't have anybody in a breakaway or a chase group now that Lawrence de Plus has been reeled in. But yeah, we'll definitely do that at the end of this tour. 
Um, I already have the jerseys in a tier list, so we can do we can do teams. But I'll get loads of the rider profile pictures together, and we can do riders as well. And I mean, heck, maybe you can send one in. I'll send you the um, what's the word? The template. And you can do one, send it in, and we'll critique it on stream. Have some good-hearted debate. But off goes another attack. Two Jayco Alula riders are involved. It's a big cook, little cook scenario. Simon Yates playing the role of little cook. As Cyprien Sarazin. Five wins in the World Cup of Skiing for his home nation of France is in the director's car today of Christian Proudhon. Even Ineos doesn't understand what Visma's trying to do. Yeah, it's, it's hard to put a finger on what their tactics are at the moment as Intermarché want to send a rider off the front. Yeah, it's very hard to determine what they're trying, but they're certainly trying something, and I am enjoying watching it. Even though it isn't a breakaway day, and I love a breakaway day, if there's one thing I do love at this in cycling, it is when the breakaway goes the distance. Um, and we've missed out on that this year. But somebody who did go the distance yesterday was Jasper Philipson. And, of course, reveling in that victory is Alpes Indiconing's team manager, Philip Rudhoft. He had to say this at the end of yesterday's stage. I think everything has finally clicked into place. The first week wasn't like we planned, but that started with the crash of Jasper Philipson. So I think it's normal that then things become a bit more difficult. Then he got disqualified, so I think we can say as a team, we stayed calm. We kept the confidence, and I think everybody can see now why we stayed calm. We knew we had the quality in-house with Jasper and the lead-out, and the opportunities would come. We are now at three so we can only be happy about that three stage wins, of course. I think the timing when we first got to the front was textbook, but everybody knows we worked hard on it. We invested a lot in the lead out and the sprint train. It gives us confidence to the sprinter and the team gets confidence out of the fact that we know if the lead out is good, it's very difficult to beat Jasper. It all fell into place today. We've seen it. It's a pity that there's a crash, but it doesn't change anything. With or without the crash, Jasper had to go for the win, and at the end of the day, it makes a big difference for the green jersey. I think the battle is more open than we could have expected or hoped for, and we will do everything to try and get that one also in Nice. Of course, it's not a big surprise. It's been nervous. It's always the case when it's flat and everybody expects a sprint. What we have seen this year is that there is very little interest from other teams to have an early breakaway and create some visibility. Everybody knows it's just waiting for the final. All of a sudden, the speed goes up and it goes extremely fast. I think we have the benefit of the quality of the riders we have, but also the riders have been together for quite a long time. That helps us stay calm and come with perfect timing. The quality of the sprint and the lead out was textbook today. That's something to be proud of as well as the victory. We're sorry about the crash, but in the end we can't change it. We didn't cause anything, so it just happened. It does bring Jasper closer to green, like his crash in the first week took him very far away from green. Even before the crash, we didn't give up on green though. Jasper was also involved in the intermediate sprints, and it's very clear now that he's got closer, so there's no reason not to believe that we can find ourselves in the green jersey. You think Roman Bardet's win was quite nice and breakaway-ish? I did enjoy those first two stages. Those, uh, and I unfortunately, I thought it was going to set the tone for the rest of the Tour de France. I thought it was going to be the Tour de France of the proletariat and the Tour de France of the breakaway. But that was not the case. At least not up until now. We had Bardet, we had Turgis, and we had Vortana. Are there any others that I can think of off the top of my head? I don't think so. But Healy is trying once again to get into the breakaway. He's got Wout van Aert on his wheel. Following Wout van Aert is Marc Soler, who has reeled this move in and kept Healy inside the peloton.
So he hasn't made it. Probably after the intermediate sprint, I'll have a short break. As Lascano goes, followed by Intermarche Wanti, who themselves will want to get involved in the intermediate sprint with the green jersey holder, Biniam Giamai. But once again, there's no rhyme or reason to these breakaways. There is clearly no telephone breakaway, as Victor Kompanarts likes to call it, where it is clearly communicated between multiple riders that we go. Magnus Court likes to get himself involved in a telephone breakaway, as do many of the Belgian riders. But for the moment, that has not happened. And at the moment... The peloton remains at 50 seconds behind this leading group of four riders. Who are probably wondering when they'll get some support and how they've managed to not get caught at the moment. Attack on the right-hand side from former world champion Rui Costa of EF, current Portuguese national champion. And he has been swiftly followed by Movistar. Christophe Laporte as well is on monitoring duty. Yeah, but this Visma Lisa bike uh, tactic does feel like they are just throwing all of their cards and seeing if any of them land and get a royal flush. But we've got 10 kilometers until Vane. And that is where the intermediate sprint will occur. And after that intermediate sprint point, there's pretty much 60, no, not even 60. No, actually, I'm a complete liar. 60 kilometers to go until Super Devilly and the top of that climb and the end of the day. Which is incredible, especially with how slowly yesterday went. Either way, the Peloton are sat at around 56 seconds behind the breakaway. And a breakaway that includes Tish Bedot of Visma Lisa Bike, Bob Jungles of Red Bull Bore Hansker, Roman Gregoire of Group Armour FDJ, and Magnus Court of UnoX Mobility. Louis Meinsch is as our next rider to launch a move. He's followed by Total Energy. Matteo Jorgensen in there as well. He's been very active for Visma Lisa Bike, who have just been very active in general as a team during this race. Today, at least. And they do have themselves a gap, but there is no communication at the moment in this breakaway group that have forced themselves off the front of the peloton. Visma are also represented in a group of four trying to latch themselves onto the chase. Biniam Gilmai is now following an attack by Bahrain Victorias out of the peloton. And is that Jasper Philipson with him? Because if he's trying to follow Philipson, that is very... That's a statement of intent from Gilmai that Philipson is not allowed any leeway. And it is... So Gilmai is following Philipson with all of his power. So Philipson is invested in this green jersey. And that is making me smile because we will have a battle by the looks of things. But Magnus Court and the Smurf moustache 
is about to take over from Bobby Ungrels, who himself has been in blue for many years of his career. At quick step, was a GC rider and a very competent one at that. Back in the day, won the Young Riders jersey at the Giro d'Italia in 2014. Not 2014, 2017. I'm waffling. And he won a stage at that race as well. But he's finished in the top 10 of the Giro d'Italia multiple times. His prime kind of GC hunting role was 2016 and 2017, where he finished 6th and 8th in the Giro. But off go barring Victorious now, who launched yet another move. And the man who's launched it, seemingly, is Walt Poles. So Walt Poles has launched it for Bahrain Victorious. Followed by EF Education Easy Post at the moment. But a look over the right shoulder. And the group hasn't gone to chase Walt Poles. With the Dutchman away on his own at the moment for Bahrain Victorious who are yet to be victorious at this Tour de France. Marich requires some attention from the team car off of the rear of the peloton. As we have an attack on the right-hand side by Rui Costa. Adam Yates, we've spoken about him and his potential condition thanks to an interview by team, some, one of the higher-ups at UAE Team Emirates, uh, Machin. The diagnosis was not COVID, but a high temperature and no sickness. So he's just off the back of the peloton. Looks like he's making his way back into the main group. But every time this race begins to die down, another move goes off the front. Third in the intermediate points classification, Brian Kukar has found himself in a breakaway that has gone off the front of the peloton. And there's a bit of blocking going on amongst the teams that have already got riders up the road. More and more riders are pinning off the front of the peloton, anxious that they're going to miss the killer move. And the riders that have done that latest are Paul Lepera, and one of the riders from Israel Premier Tech. They can see the leading group up the road, but the gap on the road is well over a minute. It's a minute 12 at the moment to the peloton. I'm sure that gap will go down as time passes. But for now, the race has been more than on. We've done two hours and 10 minutes in the saddle and we're heading towards 110 kilometers completed on the road. We've been going over 50 kilometers an hour on average. And it has been, as you say, Alpha, a crazy, crazy stage with a leading group of four riders up the road who have been up the road for the vast majority now of the day. But they've not got any more of a gap than they have now, really, which is just under a minute 20. Which is testament to how difficult today has been. We'll approach the intermediate sprint in vain fairly shortly. And we'll get the views of the green jersey, Binium Giamai, a little indication into his injuries and how affected he is by them and we'll also get the views of Jai Hindley, Tali Pradacha and Machu van der Poel Hindley, to, uh, Hindley at the end oh my god, Hindley at the start of today uh, Binium Gilmai Pradacha and van der Poel at the end of yesterday Pradacha kept it short and sweet in his everybody else kind of offered something a little bit more but that is the situation right now. 
and we are heading very quickly towards vein where our intermediate sprint will be played out our points will be divvied up and we will have a greater idea of how close Jasper Philipson can get to Biniam Diomai or vice versa how far Biniam Diomai can get away from Jasper Philipson Attack once again by EF Easy Post. It's Richard Carapaz who goes for it off the front of the peloton. And he's got a gap on his own. Being followed by three, now four riders that have pinged off the front of the peloton. Little Trek represented in that group of four. And more and more riders are instigating the chase. We've seen this before. So many riders wanting to get involved that it gets reeled back in again. But will this be the one that goes? It's a real lottery where you've got to buy your ticket and hope that it comes through as a jackpot. And at the moment, the riders who have got at least three numbers and will be taking home at least a little bit of the prize. That's Tish Benotes, Bobby Ungles, Roman Gregoire, Magnus Court. They're kind of that meme picture of the, the girl with the house on fire in the background. Those Envy wheels are superb with 30 mil tyres down. Who's on them? Um, I, I, I'm not a... What's the word? I'm not a major... I've, I've not got a major interest in, uh, in bike tech, but I have been keeping an eye on, like, you know, models and all of that but yeah who's on there envy wheels imagine there was no dsq of jasper things would be very different but jeremiah needs to fight for it i did see um one of the uae riders on the rest day was on zips which is a little bit different to the rest of the team obviously um i didn't know who it was it was one of the teammates of pagarcha definitely wasn't pollock But you've still got so many moves off the front of the peloton. It is absolutely raucous at the front of this race. And there is no time to stop at all. I mean, I've got a little bit of food in front of me that I was gradually planning to eat across the day. But I've not had time at all to do any of that. And it is Cofidis that are forcing it on at the moment. Brian Krokar is sat in the wheel of a teammate. Of course, Kokar trying to hold his own in third in the points classification. As a reminder, this is what the points classification looks like. Jeremiah on 376, Philipson on 344, and Brian Kokar on 179. So the main number you are looking at here isn't any of those three. It is actually 32, which is the gap from Jasper Philipson to Biniam Jomai. So 32 is the number to keep in your head as we approach one kilometre remaining until the sprint for the breakaway group. So the breakaway continues to press on as we head quickly towards Vein. We've got 500 metres to go until the intermediate sprint points are mopped up. 20 points, of course, for the rider first across the line. And this group of four up front plays into the hands of Biniam Jomai. Fewer points for Jasper Philipson to sweep up if he does go for the intermediate sprint. And I think with Jomai's crash yesterday it puts him already on the back foot so this group going away and sweeping up the first four spots in the intermediate sprint definitely helps the Eritrean and at the moment it's Magnus Court that leads the way will he hand over to Roman Gregoire before the intermediate sprint it doesn't look as if so 
and Uno X will take home 20 points and the prize money for going over the intermediate sprint in first position. Roman Gregoire in second, Teixe Bredo third, and fourth place goes to Bob Jungles. Now we look at the peloton. Jasper Philipson is getting a lead out off of his final lead out man for Alpes de Kerning. Biniam Jomai is slotted firmly onto the wheel. Brian Cocard could be a thorn in the side of one of these two here. He's currently on the wheel of Biniam Jomai. jomai has got two Intermarche 1C teammates alongside him as Jasper Philipson lights it up. Jomai goes right hand side. Philipson closes him off to the barriers. Jomai draws alongside, gets past. Will Philipson find anything to get back alongside him? No, he can't. Biniam Jomai crosses the line in front in the peloton. Jasper Philipson went for it but could only manage second from the peloton. And Brian Krakar third. So your top three in the points classification are your top three across the intermediate sprint in the peloton. And Biniam Jomai increases his lead. Arno Dali was involved for Lotto Destiny as well as Anthony Turgis for Total Energy. Turgis, of course, in fourth and looking to close on Brian Krakar. In the end, there were two places between the Frenchmen. So yeah, big dub for Binny. Major dub for Binny, who crosses the intermediate sprint line in first position. Hopefully, this gives me a chance to finish off my half-eaten food that has been sitting there for a long time now. A little message on the radio from one of the Intermarche Wanty riders when he crossed the intermediate sprint, probably a message of congratulations. But the breakaway continues to try and form, so there is no time for breath at all in this race. It's Jake or Alula who are lighting it up with Michael... No, that's Luka Mezgic. I was about to say Michael Matthews. But no. Once again, the pace dies out, and that means that another attack will come fairly shortly, and it's come from Jaco Alula once more. That looked to be Yates. They are trying desperately to get Simon Yates into this breakaway of Jaco Alula. And for the moment, they have not done that. Sandy Dujardin of Total Energy just looked over his shoulders, surveyed the damage. Monitoring where the next move will come from. I was, again, planning to uh, stop and have an actual meal, like actual lunch. At the moment, I'm just eating, like, cereal bars. Um, I bought three of them. So, I've got 3-2 already, which was the plan. Um, but I was planning to get through them a little earlier than usual. But for now, that's not been the case. So, with Binny crossing the line in first place, it's quite obvious that we can see his condition. But here was what he was saying after yesterday's stage about his potential condition. Unfortunately, Binny said today was not an easy finish. This is the last sprint stage and everybody gets more excited and then tries to do as much as they can in front. I also tried to be there. There are lots of roundabouts in the last 10 kilometers and it gets narrow after every roundabout. Suddenly, an EF rider touched my handlebars. I don't have anything to do. I'm just fully braked, but I found myself on the ground. Luckily, I'm okay and I'm able to ride, so that's a good thing. The knee is the most hurt because I landed straight on it, but my knee is big. My elbow already has two stitches, but that's not a problem. I'm okay. When you crash on the day, it's okay, but when you wake up in the morning, it does hurt a lot. Mentally, I'm okay, so that's not going to be a problem. 
We will see tomorrow. Hopefully I will be okay. When I crashed and then got up, I saw I was able to ride my bike. I was happy. For me, I don't care if I lose the jersey or keep it. I'd just like to arrive in Nice without any more trouble. We're still not finished yet, so I'll try to fight until Nice. And he's certainly doing that, and he's winning that fight at the moment. But the fight for the breakaway is still more than on. And it's on fire right now. So many riders wanting to get off the front. 43 seconds is now the gap to the front four. And we have got a proper, proper strap for the breakaway. This has been a ridiculous stage of brake formation. This has probably been the most ridiculous stage of brake formation. I think we'll also do stage rankings as well for the uh, Tour de France. On uh, on a tier list, so we'll be we'll be doing tier list central basically on the final day. All sorts of tier lists all over the place. But this is Ryan Gibbons who has lit it up for Little Trek, and is away at the front of the race for now. And he's dragged a small group along with him. DSM Fermi Postenel have representation. Sean Quinn is there. For EF Easy Post, but a much larger group is now joining them. And the Peloton seem content with letting that one go. A couple of riders see that they've missed this. A real golden opportunity to get to the breakaway. And are trying their best to latch themselves on or force an even bigger group away from the front of the Peloton. At the moment, that is not happening. Everybody following each other means that everything eventually gets neutralised. As Binny of Jomai is chatting, intriguingly enough, with the man who he crashed with yesterday. Both of the sprinters, this one for EF Easy Post, Marijn Vandenberg, who was the EF rider that he tangled handlebars with. And on the back of the peloton, looking over his shoulder is Michael Matthews, perhaps for assistance from the Jaco Alula team car. But you've got a mahoosive group now that have formed a chase. A group of over 30 riders. Based on eye test alone. And four of those riders are trying to rip it off the front of the chasers. And they have done so. A fifth rider from Uno X has latched on. And more riders are looking to get involved. It's Harold Tejada who has been the first to launch it for Astana. But there is no cooperation whatsoever. And this break formation phase is ridiculous. 57 seconds is the gap between the front four and the peloton. And that says a lot about cooperation. Because our cooperating group, despite all of the attacks and increases in pace from the peloton, are still gaining on the group of the yellow jersey. This is very quickly looking like yet another stage for Pogaccia or Vingegaard. Whether they want it to be like that, I'm not sure. Now, if I'm somebody who's wanting to get into the breakaway, I'm just going to hang on to the GC group for as long as possible and maybe go on the climbs themselves. Probably the Col de Noyer, if they make it that far. As we've got the Nuns Pitters fan club, by the looks of things. Big sign saying Alle Nuns. Of course, a rider who banked a Tour de France stage win from the breakaway into Ludonviel in 2020, when he beat... Ilnur Zakarin, who was first over the top of the final climb, but we know his descending capabilities post Giro d'Italia crash. So yeah, couldn't descend his way to victory, was overtaken by Nuns Pitters, and then by Tom Schkoids and Carlos Verona, now teammates at Little Trek. 
and both at this year's Tour de France. But Pitts is, of course, stage winner at the Tour from a breakaway. It looks like it's not going to be a breakaway that takes the stage today. But I think because of the uh, excitement of today's stage, I will not quit streaming. And because I've got other things that I want to do on Twitch this year, other than watching the race live, which is always the most fun thing for me. And it keeps my uh, commentary head on. But either way, we've got the call by R coming up fairly shortly. We're around 15 kilometers from the foot of it. And it is a nasty little climb. 6.9 kilometers, 7.1% average. Let's call it 7Ks at 7%. But it does ease off in the final few hundred meters. So it is much higher than the 7.1% average in the thick of the climb. As Joao Almeida finds himself off the back of the chase group for certain. Is this the group of the yellow jersey? I'm not sure. I think it is with the speed at which they're going or lack thereof. And for now, it looks like this is a major chase group that are looking to bridge the gap to the front four, who still press on. They've got 52 seconds to close, with the peloton at 1 minute 10 behind this front quartet. Adam Blythe having an interview with the EF car. Hopefully he's grilling them on how terrible they've been, missing all of these breakaways. But they've got Richard Carapaz into the chase group at the very least. Geraint Thomas is one of the Ineos riders in there along with Lawrence de Plus. Luca Mezgetz is there for Jacob Alula. Along with Pavel Sivakov of UAE Team Emirates. Jack Hague's there for Bahrain Victorious. Roman Bardet for DSM at Fermanich Post NL. Jan Hirt has found himself in the move while Poles 2 for Bahrain victorious. Little Trek have hammered as many riders in the breakaway that they could possibly get. Jasper Stuyven, Ryan Gibbons and Julian Bernard will probably be on teammate duty for Tom Schroins, the Latvian in the breakaway. Mark Soler has also found himself in there for UAE Team Emirates. And whenever there's a UAE Team Emirates rider in there, there will be a Visma rider in there. Two Visma riders and two UAE Team Emirates riders cancelling each other out. Soler and Sivakov for UAE. Van Aert and Laporte for a Visma Lisa bike. But I think the leading group is doing the right thing at the moment. They are continuing to press on because the gap is still less than a minute between the chase group and the peloton. And they don't want to get themselves reeled in just because they've been involved in this chase. Juliansen is there for Jaco Alula alongside Mezgetz, as I was saying. And Bruno Amirai as well is represented for Decathlon Azure Desert. And finally, potentially, a sense of calm in the peloton. Teddy Pogac has moved himself back to mid-pack in the peloton. And riders are taking nature breaks. Most importantly, Jonas Vingegaard, as Ryan Gibbons drops back from the breakaway, or sorry, the chase group, to the peloton. So I'm not sure as to what that manoeuvre is for, whether he's looking at keeping Giulio Giacone out of trouble. But that is your situation for the moment. I think I'm going to go off for some uh, food right now. I will be back in about two minutes. I hope nothing happens. But for the sake of uh, continuity, the head of the race now are at 50.8 kilometers to go. The chasing group are 56 seconds behind the, uh, the head of the race. 
and the peloton are at two minutes and five seconds so hopefully those gaps don't change too heavily and hopefully not too much is going to happen right i'm off to do myself some lunch which i'm already very late for Right, hello, I'm back for a very short while before I have to collect my lunch out of the microwave. If anybody is interested, it's uh, it's pasta. Classic choice. So, I hopefully haven't missed anything. I'm about to get pictures back, so... Again, I hope nothing's changed. Or at least that the massive chase group has caught up to the leading group of four. Either way, I'm about to get pictures back, so that's good. So we've got Laporte and Van Aert, Sivakov and Soler, Julian Sinemesgetz, for Fisma Lisa Bike, UAE Team Emirates, and Jacob Alula. De Plus and Thomas for Ineos Grenadiers, Bernard, Schroins, Steuben for Little Trek. But anyway, the breakaway are up the road. They are still four riders. They've got one minute and two seconds on the chasing pack. 
and now they've got team cars, so they can get non-neutral service water bottles, and they can get bottles with, you know, sort of salts in and important nutritional stuff. So they've got a minute and three on the chasers, three minutes and 27 seconds on the peloton. The chasing group, led by Total Energy for now. And Ryan Gibbons is actually in that chasing group, so I'm not sure about what was going on with the uh, South African champion there. But that's the situation with 46.8 kilometres remaining. Will the chase group make it to our leading group of four? Certainly one of the leading group of four will take the combativity prize, I'm sure of that. But will the chasing group make it to the front of the race? My pasta smells incredibly good. Don't worry, I will mute up while I am eating. But they've got uh, Contador at the moment, Eurosport, going up the Super Devu League line. And it is a bit of a killer. And it is certainly a very aesthetically pleasing climb. Lovely scenery. If you find it on a good day, and it is certainly a good day today. Very hot, very sunny in France. Jordan Jega, who is one of the big breakouts of the Total Energy team, has found himself into this breakaway. I know he might be somebody to watch in future Jordan Jega. A talented climber and hill rider who is starting to be found by the World Tour teams. And he's starting to prove his talents at the Grand Tour level. He's a young rider as well, only 25. And a rider who is in his first season with Total Energy after graduating from the Nantes Atlantique Continental team. Does have a contract for next season, so is not one of those riders racing for a contract. But Simon Yates and Michael Matthews are in the breakaway as well for Jaco Alula. So there are an immense amount of big hitters in this breakaway, but they currently find themselves over a minute behind our leading group of four. Nils Pollitt is on the front of the peloton. Perhaps they're looking at a Tadej Pogacar stage win and a chance to increase his time gap in the general classification based on bonus seconds. I suspect, probably not from gaining any time on the road. I think Super Devuli is, is not steep enough of a climb to, to force those types of gaps. But I suppose we'll see what happens when we eventually get to it. Ineos Grenadiers are on the radio. It's such a big group to really read. I know you guys see who's there, but try. But for me, Van Aert is going to try and go early, okay? He's going to sit on and try and go early when you get close to those front four. So Ineos are choosing to keep an eye on Wout Van Aert, which is an intriguing decision because he's been involved in multiple breakaways before, which haven't gone the distance. He was involved in the first group that eventually found themselves off the front of the peloton, which was Jared Drisner's Wout van Aert, Harold Tejada, and Tobias Harland Johannesson of Uno X. And I thought that was going to be the breakaway for a long time, because they were in front for quite a while. And they did have, of course, Drisner's and van Aert, who are very good flat engines on their day.
But the gap between the breakaway and the chasers is now up to one and a half minutes. So it is a real, real struggle to see how this is going to play out. What is happening though is that the Peloton have totally taken the impetus out of the chase. Yes, Nils Pollitt is on the front, but everybody else is cruising. Nils Pollitt, who is going to be up there if I ever do a rider tier list. He's had a really good Tour de France and has showed Red Bull Bora Hanskra why they may have been a little silly to let him go. Nils Pollock is definitely not one of my favourite riders. Wink, wink. We are very quickly heading towards the Alps, though, and the Alpine climbs. The first of which, the Col Bayard. And there is only one team that have not made the breakaway. We saw Axel Laurence try for Alpecin de Kerning earlier on, but they have not found a rider in either the lead group or the chasers, and they are the only team that have missed it. So Pollock leads the way. He looks unflustered. He's joined the Tade Pogaccia Tuft out of the helmet gang. We saw him comically sprinting yesterday with uh, Pogaccia. He won the bike throw on the line and seemingly organised it as well. Jan Tratnik just monitoring Pollock's pace alongside Yves Lampart. Remco Avenipole sat very frontward in the peloton. And with less than 40 kilometres to go, we are entering the Gap region. We plunge down a slight false flat descent, and then we are at the foot of the Col Bayard. And that is where things will start to get incredibly serious once more. We had our little lull. We've had the breakaway form and it has immediately got 4 minutes and 20 seconds. And I'm surprised UAE obviously have riders in the breakaway so they don't want to control it. And it is an opportunity now for riders who thought this was going to be a GC day to get themselves a piece of Tour de France action. Richard Carapaz in the chasing group could complete the trilogy of Grand Tour stage wins. He's already won at the Giro d'Italia and at the Vuelta a España before. But at the moment, he's going to have to catch the leading group of four if he wants any chance of doing that. He's won three stages at the Giro and three at the Vuelta, but is yet to take a stage win on the Tour de France, which is quite incredible for a rider of his talent. Roman Gregoire must feel like he's been through the ringer. The sweat is visible on his jersey. All of the salts that he's getting rid of. And he's been in a group with three elder statesmen, experienced heads. And has held his own for the moment. Teixe Bonneau, Bob Jungels and Magnus Kaur, all of which 
have plenty of Grand Tour experience and plenty of experience in the Peloton. The Frenchman is just getting started in his career, really. And has been getting better year on year. Had a very good 2023. A little bit more stunted 2024, but he's been racing bigger races this year. And he's got himself involved in the biggest race of them all in 2024. 6.8 kilometres then for the Troll Bayard. Well over 7% average. And it is a killer of a first climb. Second category label. So you've got five King of the Mountains points for the first rider over the top. For the moment, that's not going to threaten Tade Podarch's lead in the polka dot jersey. And once again, the polka dot jersey is going to a GC rider. Maybe there will be just a discussion about that in future stages. Harman Halka has made it in the breakaway. Out of interest, here are my uh, ones to watch for today. I was going to put Armband Halka in this, but it didn't end up happening. Now, let's say Luxenko on the left-hand side might be the worst ones to watch pick ever because he's abandoned the race. Today, Mohoric and Mühlberger, I have yet to actually check whether they're in. If none of them are in, this is incredibly embarrassing. Okay, Mühlberger's not in. Mohoric is, but is probably going to be going for Jack Cade or Walt Poles. So basically, there's no chance, and that is the last time I'm showing that ones to watch page, at least for this stage, because that is a horror show from me. Over four and a half minutes now, the gap between the head of the race and the peloton. Around three minutes between the chasing group and the peloton, which we might as well call the second group. Well over 45 riders involved in that chase. But at the moment, they are making no inroads to the group of four. Which is quite incredible to say. I'm a group of four who have been out front for most of the day as well. This chase group have pretty much just formed, really. So should be fresh as a daisy, or at least semi-fresh. Much fresher, at least, than the breakaway, but seemingly no inroads made as of yet. But now the pressure is being applied. The chase group are starting to get themselves together as Sandy Dujardin gets dropped from said chase. He's more of a sprinter, so wouldn't be looking at today as an opportunity for a stage win. But he will have done all he could to help out Jordan Jega, among others. Also gone from the breakaway is Nico Denz. Stage winner, of course, at the Giro d'Italia. Won't be able to do that at the Tour de France. At least not today. Elsewhere, two Jaco Alula riders have gone pop. That is Michael Matthews and Luca Mezgitz. Also there, intriguingly enough for FDJ, it's our first big name, David Gordou. Has been shelled. Ryan Gibbons has also been dropped 
as well as Matej Mohoric, lovely for my ones to watch. As well as Marc Soler, who has been distanced. So Pavel Sivakov now the only UAE rider in that chasing group. And all of a sudden, this climb is starting to hurt for plenty of riders on gradients over 10%. Out the back goes Harold Tejada. He's another one who has gone. Astana keen on getting him into breakaways in this final week. So he has a busy five days ahead of him. Also dropped as well for Intermarche Wanty is Georg Zimmermann. So he's going to have no involvement in today's stage. Dorian Gordon is also towards the rear. Along with Jasper Steuben. But Soler is continuing a tempo. So I don't know whether he's riding within himself. And just gradually chasing this one back. He's certainly gaining on the rest of the riders who have been shelled from this chasing group. Christopher Yule Jensen also has made way. So Simon Yates is now all alone in his pursuit of the stage win, which looks ever more likely with the peloton now over five minutes behind. Harm van Hulk is gone. As well as Stefan Kuhn. Dorian Godon also shelled out of the back of the chasing group. And now we can see what's doing the damage. At the moment, it's Warren Bargy of DSM Fermanic Postenel, a rider who's been fairly quiet at this Tour de France. Of course, his French counterpart, Romain Bardet, took the stage win on stage one and the yellow jersey along with it. Niels Pollitt is just setting an incredibly slow pace in the peloton and the gap keeps on rising, but riders are being dropped from this pace. It's the big guys though, Sir Werner Schold, Mark Cavendish done a great job on such a difficult stage to stay within range, as of all the sprinters really. It has been all over the road for most of the day, so it's a great job from Cavendish especially to stay on that, with the peloton on that little bump in the middle of the stage. But our group of four continue pressing on 3.4 kilometers to the summit. Three kilometers to the top of the Col Bayar, and it is Magnus Court leading the way. But we have an attack from the chasing group, and it is the Catalan Aje Desert that are forcing it. Bruno Armirai is the first rider to blink, and it's probably a good time to blink because the gap has consistently stayed at 1 minute 40. They've not been making inroads into this leading quartet. 
any of us were worried about Wild Van Aert. In fact, it was Bruno Armirai that's been the first to go. He's taken Warren Bardi with him alongside Jordan Jega. Andrew Palmer FUJ are also represented. Geraint Thomas is trying to close this one down for the Ineos Grenadiers. And he's got one of the DSM contingent on the wheel. Little Trek also represented towards the front of this chasing group. But that move from Armirai has at least closed the gap to under a minute and a half now. Hello Isolati, I've just seen you here. How are you doing? Climb is dropping while the port chilling there. I mean, pretty good ride from, from Christoph so far. Do you think Wout can seriously take this one? Do you think he's got a chance? Off goes Armourai again, this time followed by a different DSM Fermanagh Post and L rider. I think Jega as well is rolling with this move too. As Javier Romo just goes off the back, looking for assistance from the Movistar team car. This is Onley, so Oscar Onley is following for now the man from Kelso in Scotland. Win props not, but he needs to perform, sure he has some climbing legs if he wants a chance at Olympics. That's a good, good breakdown of things, to be honest with you. That's probably his intentions, you're right. But EF have also gone on a move, which is getting the fan in the American shirt very excited albeit it's not his American pookie bear Sean Quinn Kevin Volkerlan has been dropped from this chasing group along with Stefan Kuhn Volkerlan I'm sure won't care after his stage 2 victory seeing this stage you would say more Carapaz I agree with that. But all of these attacks are gradually thinning the gap to the breakaway group of four. More views of Dan McClay, Sertan Valdenschall, Jared Drisners, Case Boll and Mark Cavendish off the rear of the peloton. Along with UAE Team Emirates' Tim Wellens, who has been distanced. The Ineos Grenadiers rider is Michal Kwiatkowski, who was involved in early brake formation, but didn't make it up the road, which is unlike Kwiatkowski. Garcia Piana and Iking have also been distanced now. As off the back is Robert Hayes and Dagan Corbin Acoff have done their jobs as well. DSM Fermanagh Postenel, their two sprinters, as well as Frank Vandenbroek, a man who was so key on stage one. As Guillaume Martin has launched a move, as we still see all of the rest of the riders dropped, Ballerini, as well as Fabien Grelier. And this is the Guillaume Martin attack, and it is a good time for it because the gap is 50 seconds between the leaders and the chasing group. So Guillaume Martin is on the move. 
gets absolutely whacked by a woman with a flag looking at the camera. Nice job. Hopefully she gets a fine. Martin unhappy, but gets back to it and gets it out of his head fairly quickly. We've got one and a half kilometers to the top for the breakaway group. But Guillaume Martin is on the chase. Everything is still under control, and it is Nils Pollock doing the controlling. This is Breakaway Stage written all over it. And what an unbelievable day it has been. 33 and a half kilometers to go, and Guillaume Martin has got a friend in the chase group. And it's a fellow Frenchman, Valentin Madoua, of Group Armour FDJ. And this is the replay of the woman hitting Guillaume Martin with the flag. Good to see her face in high definition. So she can get a visit from the authorities. Martin, though, has got a little bit of a gap on Valentin Madoua, who closed it originally. Can he do the same now? Ford Group Armour FDJ who have had a terrible Tour de France this year. But I don't think either of them are going to catch the leading group of four as we go over the first climb of the day. They've got one kilometre to go until they reach the top of the Col Bayard. And for now... They've got 35 seconds on Madoua and Guillaume Martin. This leading group of four have done an incredible ride to hold the gap to the breakaway of around a minute, at least to the large changes in group. Geraint Thomas now being dropped, of course has COVID, so makes sense. He's been closing down moves for Lawrence de Plus. To go for the stage win. As well as Arkea Samsic's Raul Garcia Pierna. Not Arkea Samsic, Arkea BNB Hotels. Are we still living in 2019? And old Christian Iking has been distanced as well. So that's the group of three off the back of the main chasing group pack. And it flattens out here over the top of the climb. So it'll be a chance to gain some speed before our gradual descent to the Col de Noyer. It'll be a short valley before our second climb of the day, category one in classification. So Isolates dropped Carapaz. I'd I'd have agreed with Carapaz. I think the three I'd have circled before the day would have been Carapaz van Halke and probably Lutsenko, which, again, hasn't aged well at all. Over the top of the Col Bayard then, and it is taken by Magnus Court, who takes home five points and a little bit of prize money, as well as crossing the intermediate sprint line, taking home 20 green jersey points and even more prize money. All of the points have gone, so Guillaume Martin and Valentin Madouas' two up chase are not going to take home any King of the Mountains points, and I don't think either of them are interested in the Polka Dot jersey, in all honesty. Pogacar leads the way in that classification on 77 points. Of course, we heard towards the start of this broadcast, Machin wanted a breakaway to go, and in the end he's got it. 
intriguingly enough, a rider who has got teammates in this breakaway, and more importantly, one right at the front of this race, is Jai Hindley. Before the start of today's stage, he had this to say, The team is super motivated to try and pick up a stage win. I think today can be a good shot, so we'll do everything we can to put ourselves in the break. I don't think the green jersey will play too much into it. I think if it's all together, when we come to the sprint, then maybe it will. I think it will probably also take a long time for the break to go. It's a flatter start, so everyone can be there fighting in it. I think it's one of the last opportunities for a lot of guys, so every man and his dog will try to be in the move today. I personally am pretty tired. I think everyone's pretty cooked. It hasn't been the best tour for me personally. It hasn't been how I wanted it to go, but that's also life. We're out here today and the boys are keen. We'll see if we can make the most of it today. And Bobby Jungles is certainly making the most of it. What did I just hear on the team uh, the Tour de France radio? It was something about like the cars can't go up super devilly or something like that. But I'm not going to spread misinformation, so I'm not going to talk about it. I was incredibly confused because I only caught the last bit of that message. It was something about because of the excessive amount of fans, something couldn't get through or whatever. Whether it was the convoy of cars at the front or like the, the caravan, I'm not sure. But either way, that sounds pretty worrying. <laughs> Nils Pollock continues at the front of the peloton, however, and is shelling more and more riders gradually. It's still only suited to the sprinters being dropped from the back, though. Alexander Christoph, Sylvain Dillier, and Dylan Hrunewagen are three of the major names that have been dropped, along with Jake Stewart, who is a lead out man for Pascal Ackerman. And a rider who was involved in some of the early break formation. The man from Coventry. Remco Avenapol sat alongside one of his GC arrivals for the podium. In Carlos Rodriguez. I highly doubt there's going to be any GC action. With the gap being six and a half minutes. And the pace set by Nils Pollitt being so easy and gradual. And on a stage that has been so incredibly hot to begin with, you've got no action between the GC riders. Honestly, don't mind it. As long as we've got action amongst the breakaway, and for the moment we have, it'll be a good stage. And it has been a bit of an all-timer based on break formation. That has been ridiculous. But down the descent go our leading four, led by Magnus Court. Bob Jungles, we know, is a good descender from his days at Azure Desert Citroën. And that infamous Tour de France stage he won ahead of Thibaut Pinot. However, has looked a bit ragged on descents this year. Missed a lot of breaking points, gone wide a couple of times. Seemingly, you can get a lot of speed on the straight sections, but isn't too good when it comes to twisty sections of descent. So he's a good comrade to have on a descent like this, where corners are so gradual and there's no need for braking. So I suspect they will gain time on Valentin Madois and Guillaume Martin. Especially because Benoit, Jungles and Court, especially, are bigger in terms of weight. 
so you'd expect would go down quicker. Madawara Martan, more climby types. Madawara Puncher, Martan, a pure climber. So there's less chance of them going down a descent quickly, at least when they're not pedalling. But that's the situation for now. 1 minute 16 to the vast chasing group that should gain time back once we hit the valley. But they can't give this group of four too much time just because it could get a little bit tight for the stage win. Hanging on to the back of the peloton at the moment is Alexander Kristoff, which tells you a lot about the pace that Niels Pollock is putting in on the front. Because he was dropped not too long ago, but has made it back on before they went over the top of the Col Bayar. Lenny Martinez stretching out his back. And a man who came into this tour not really prepared for it and hasn't delivered. So it's quite hard to rank him. But there we are. And we will soon be at the Col du Noyer. There is a short, flat valley before we reach the Category 1 climb. And then it will start to get serious once more. That is the trickiest climb of the three. Category 1 in classification as they go past a Intermarche fuel station. Matej Mohoric hands over a bottle to Santiago Boitrago. And now Jake Stewart is on the front of the peloton. So yep, that is an indicator of the speed of the peloton. Jake Stewart, who is struggling to hang on before the top of the Col Bayar, has now come to the front and has started pacing. So that is the lack of damage that the peloton will cause at the end of today. It's not going to be a GC day by any means. We weren't expecting it to be, really, with so many hard stages coming up. Tomorrow is another chance at victory for the breakaway, as Alex Aramburu gets some bottles from the Movistar team car. Also towards the back there is Warren Bargi, who is after some assistance. But Aaron Boo gets a nice sticky bottle there. And begins his road to the line. One minute and 15 seconds is now the gap to the extensive chase group. And 35 seconds is the gap to our two man, what is looking like a Shasper tap, but I'm not going to condemn it as of yet. The peloton now at seven minutes. So once again, no chance from the peloton, and we are looking at a breakaway stage win. But who is going to take it from the breakaway? At the moment, in the driver's seat is one of Tish Benut, Bob Jungles, Roman Gregoire, and Magnus Court. Madouar and Martin, for the moment, are passengers, but should be able to make time up on the hillier terrain. And then take your pick from the third group on the road. Could be anybody, really, from that group. It's all going to go down to who's got the best legs on the day. And Magnus Court is using his to try and keep this gap attainable for the front four.
he hands over to Tish Benoit across Benoit with two teammates in a group behind him. <clears throat> that is Christophe Laporte, European champion, and Wat Van Aert, the Belgian. Madouar and Martin, our two man French chase, are consistently gaining time at the moment, but they are about to reach a flatter section. So Martin and Madoua continue to eke into this gap, as do the main chasing group, the third group on the road. And you've got some real big hitters in that group, Simon Yates being one of them, Wat Van Aert, of course, Jack Haig has been there or thereabouts, hasn't been around too heavily or featured too heavily in this Tour de France, but can make a real mark on today. Our group of four continue, though, and once again it goes uphill, and once again that gives a chance for Guillaume Martin and Valentin Madoua to claw some time back. Magnus Cord gets handed a bag of ice that he can stuff down the rear of his jersey from an Uno X Swanier. He takes out a couple more bags of ice and bottles. But for now, it's not Madouar and Martin that are gaining on this front four. It is the larger third group on the road. A third group that has plenty of riders with Grand Tour experience and Grand Tour stage wins under the belt. And plenty of riders who, for the first time, are beginning to look at their own glory. I'm talking Lawrence de Plus, of course a key rider in Jumbo Visma's mountain train a couple of years ago. Made the jump to Ineos Grenadiers. And is now getting his own chance as just off of the back of, I think that is the chase, is that might have been Raul Garcia Pierna. I forgot to double take the race number. But of course, bonus seconds over the top of this climb, and it is going to mean that they are swept up by the breakaway. Anders Milch is doing a piece to camera right now over the top of the Col de Noyer. And it's on paved roads as you go over the top, so would have been interesting had there been a serious battle going on as they pass the as they pass the Col de Noyer summit. But I think this leading group have now seen what is going on. Twenty point five kilometers to go then. And it looks like our double M chase group are going to make it all the way to the line.
Our group of four looked set to become a group of six at the front of the race. For now, remains a group of four, and I think they would prefer it that way. Because they're 10 seconds behind them, and they are better when it comes to Hillier Terrain, Madoua and Martin. And of course, this group of four have been out of the front of the race for multiple hours now. And have spent plenty of time in the wind and using up energy. So this is perfect opportunity for Valentin Madoua and Guillaume Martin to add another French stage win to the collection. And all of our French stage wins so far have come from unlikely sources. We've seen Bardet win stage one. We've seen Kevin Vaudrelin win stage two. We've seen Tergi win the gravel stage, stage nine. Can Valentin Madoua or Guillaume Martin provide us a fourth French stage win? Of course, Madoua is going to have Romain Gregoire with him. So FDJ have played this one very well. If they can get this group to the line. Gregoire has been doing less turns on the front for now. And I'm sure he will have informed Bernot Jungles and Court that his teammate is chasing him up the road and probably has a better chance at winning the stage as the peloton make their way down the descent of the Col Bayard, just making their way to the foot of the Col de Noyer now, or at least the foot of the valley. The motorbike camera at the front of the race turns round and it sees the ominous sight of Guillaume Martin and Valentin Madoua making their way onto the rear of the head of the race. They've got about five or six bike lengths now to close. Madoua rejects the request by the Soigneur for an extra bottle. As Simon Yates now accelerates out of the third group on the road. So this is a hit out at glory for the Brit. Who is able to follow? Takes a bottle, sprays it all over him and continues with his ride up the Col de Noyer. Of course, no more valleys now. So it is just up and down to the finish line at Super Devoli. And Simon Yates has chosen now to go for glory. Didn't get too much help from his Jaco Alula teammates, but that doesn't matter for the moment. As Geraint Thomas is dropped from the third group on the road. The third group actually now, because our second group joined up to the breakaway, and Simon Yates has formed his own chase solo now. Christophe Laporte has gone pop. He's getting some assistance from the Visma Lisa bike team car, a couple of bottles. But it means stage victory now is all in the hands of Wout van Aert. He's got nine in this Tour de France, or not in this Tour de France, in the Tour de France. 
Can he make it double figures? The double figures we're looking at at the moment is number 21. That is Simon Yates. And he has been chased by Richard Carapaz and Stevie Williams. This is a very exciting trio that smell blood here and smell the stage win. Stevie Williams having a breakout year for Israel Premier Tech at the moment. Can he add a Tour de France to what is already a glittering season? Winner at the Tour Down Under, winner at La Fleche Wallonia as well this year. But a Tour de France stage win might just trump all of those achievements. A couple more riders chasing. Laurence de Plus leads them for the Ineos Grenadiers. And he's followed at the moment by Pavel Sivakov. But Simon Yates hits out once more. He's not happy with staying with this group. He sees Carapaz and Williams behind him. And he knows that he cannot take them both to the line. He wants to go alone. And he is doing exactly that at the moment, the man from Berry, Simon Yates. Hits out, gets the tongue out. And begins his climb to the top of the Col de Noyer. That's going to be his first post where he can judge himself compared to Carapaz and Williams. Guillaume Martin, you'd suspect, also wants to get involved. The man from Cofidis, who had such a good tour last year, have been nowhere to be seen this year. They've had problems with the likes of Yonis Aguirre and Alexi Renard with illness. They've struggled in the race to get a foothold as Roman Bardet has been dropped. Along with Bora Hansgrohe's Marco Hallett. And we've got an attack from EF. Now from the second group on the road. It's Carapaz that goes. Stevie William is, is inclined to follow. None of the other riders can give up with these three. Yates, Carapaz and Williams are going to contest the stage win by the looks of things. At the moment, Isolacy's prophecy is coming true. Richard Carapaz has a chance at taking home a stage victory. Simon Yates, of course, has history at the Tour de France and has very good history at the Tour de France. Two stage wins at the biggest race in cycling and has also finished fourth in last year's race overall. Winner of the Vuelta Espana, top three, the Giro d'Italia. And he's been followed by a man who won the Giro d'Italia back in his Movistar days, Richard Carapaz. Stevie Williams, again, is having a season to remember this year. As they go past Didi the Devil. But the gap is closing. Carapaz and Williams currently situated at six seconds behind Simon Yates. And the situation at the moment is suiting Stephen Williams. He's stuck to the wheel of Richard Carapaz and he is not budging the man from Aberystwyth in the UK. The Welshman out of the saddle along with Carapaz trying to match the cadence and the gear that he's in ensuring that he can stick to the rear wheel of the Ecuadorian. And now taking this up on the descent is Visma Lisa Bike with Jan Tratnik. I'm sure there's nothing that's going to happen in the peloton. It just looks like Visma, the best they can get is the stage win. Enric Mass and Oscar Romli were with De Plus and Sivakov in that chasing group, what is now the fourth group on the road. But it looks like it's going to be played out. Between Simon Yates, Richard Carapaz and Stephen Williams. Roman Bardet has the king of the mountains for this climb in particular. But that might well be taken by Simon Yates. Who has attacked this from the foot. Dropped everybody else. Carapaz and Williams tried to make their way back on. Almost did. And Simon Yates attacked once more from the front. So it's a very offensive ride from the Brit from Jake Alula. 
And at the moment, he's holding off Carapaz and Williams, but there is not much of a gap whatsoever between the Brit and the Ecuadorian. And let's not forget Stephen Williams, glued to the rear wheel, has been active on a couple of days, but hasn't really been to the forefront of this Tour de France. And this is the perfect stage to make your mark, but at the moment, the mark he's making on the road is one going backwards from the wheel of Richard Carapaz. Carapaz has dropped one of his rivals and is in hot pursuit of the other. Carapaz and Simon Yates separated by five seconds on the road at the moment with four kilometres to go until the top of the Col du Noyer. Fifteen and a half kilometres to go in the day and it looks like we've got a mano a mano fight for the stage win. Simon Yates hits out, Richard Carapaz is chasing. This could be a GC battle at any other race, but it's the Tour de France with Tadej Pogacar and Jonas Vingegaard there. So this is a battle between two riders who are well over half an hour down in the GC, Carapaz nearly an hour behind, but showed his climbing legs on the stage to Plateau de Bay on Sunday. And is showing his climbing legs once more today. Carapaz takes a bottle, sprays himself, and continues his effort. His eyes locked on to the rear wheel of Simon Yates. He's got to try and make it there over the top of the climb and stick to his wheel on the descent. He is gradually gaining on Simon Yates. He is so close. He can almost smell the rear wheel and the rubber hitting the road of Simon Yates's rear tyre. Yates, whose career is up in the air, been at Orica Green Edge now for 10 years. Of course, now Jacob Alula. But has not got a team for next year. You suspect Jacob Alula are looking to renew his deal. Perhaps looking at what his brother's done at UAE Team Emirates, maybe wanting to do the same thing, but this is a statement ride from Yates. And at the moment, the only man that can stay with him for now is Richard Carapaz. Stevie Williams is at 25 seconds behind. Enric Mass and the rest of his group are at 43 seconds. The peloton well over eight minutes down. They are down and out of it. And I doubt there will be any more action coming from that group on the road. But all the action for now will be among two riders at the head of the race. Stevie Williams at the moment is in a solo chase group. But the third group on the road now involves Lawrence Duplus, who presses on Enric Mass on the wheel, Oscar Onley there as well as Pavel Sivakov. Trying to hold the wheel is Bobby Ungles. Magnus Court doing well as well. And so is Teish Benoit. Guillaume Martin struggling to hold onto that chase group. Who now have their eyes set on Stephen Williams in second, in third place, should I say, on the road. As Marc Soler gets swallowed up by the peloton. That's an extra teammate for Tadej Pogacar. Even though he doesn't really need it on a stage like today. But Pollitt has thinned out the peloton. And I think a lot of that will be just riders looking to finish the day. We have a groupetto that includes Mark Cavendish and Michal Kwiatkowski at the rear of the race. And this is a groupetto which includes the likes of Biniam Diomai, Mathieu van der Poel and Dylan Groenewegen that are on screen at the moment. I'd like to see more of the uh, head of the race for now, Tobias Harland Johannesson, a man who was involved so frequently in the breakaway formation at the start of the day. But who never made the breakaway in the end, got himself in a good group with Walt Van Aert, Jared Drisners, and Harold Tejada, but that wasn't the one to go. 
and he didn't have the winning ticket. Pollitt has thinned out this peloton, but it's not excessive, and we're not going to see any action from it. So the race director is probably just cutting to this, so we can still see that they are there and active. Jordan Jega seemingly has latched on to the chasing group. I'd like to see them catch Stephen Williams at this rate. But either way, that doesn't look like it's happening. So I'm going to manifest and go to a brief pod statement, Pogacar statement. Aha, uh -huh, didn't he? It, I, it was the sheer threat of it that made them switch back to Simon Yates and Richard Carapaz. So we still have a race on our hands. 7% gradients and Simon Yates continues at the front of the race. Richard Carapaz sat second wheel. Neither of them showing too much emotion. Carapaz does like to pull some faces on the road as Arno Dali gets dropped. Probably from the peloton. Thirteen and a half kilometers remain. Carapaz comes to the front to take a pull with two kilometers remaining until the summit of the Col de Noyer. Then we will plunge downhill, get to the foot of the Super Devuli, and climb the six percent average gradient to the line. Carapaz hands over to Simon Yates. And these two are working well together. It looks like it's going to be a battle between the two of them. And off goes Carapaz. The gradients hit 12% and Carapaz hits the go button. The rockets are launched. And the Jaguar is away. El Jaguar de Tulcan is on his own now. Simon Yates ups the tempo to try and follow this Carapaz attack. And he is away at the front of the race. Can he make it? The trilogy. He's got hat tricks at the Vuelta a España and the Giro d'Italia for stage wins, but he has yet to open his Tour de France account. Can he do it today? He's gone from a long way out, and these are the steepest percentages that there are left, so it's a clever decision from Carapaz. As allegedly there's an attack from Pogaccia. Or did he say Axelair from the group, Myojol? I'm not so sure. But it's an acceleration from the group, certainly. And it is Giulio Ciccone's little trek that are trying to force it. Carlos Verona is the man that's doing the pacing at the moment. And a gap has been formed. Derek G has followed Giulio Ciccone. So you've got two riders now in the top 10 of GC who have lit it up on the climb to Col du Noyer. I doubt it's going to do any excessive damage as Richard Carapaz seemingly has distanced Simon Yates. The gap is growing. And there is clear daylight now between Carapaz and Yates and this looks like it's going to be stage over. Richard Carapaz is hitting out for victory. 31 seconds to Enric Mass on the road. It looks like it's going to be too little, too late from the man from Mallorca. And at the moment, it's going to be a South American victory on this Tour de France for the first time this year. And it's going to come from one of the more likely sources. Richard Carapaz has 13 seconds on Simon Yates for now. Yates was the first to go, Carapaz sat in, waited for the opportunity, and struck. The Jaguar has found its prey, and it has more than distanced it. Enric Mass now on his own, in a third group. He's going to be chasing Simon Yates first, and then if he catches Yates, we'll be chasing Carapaz. But I think, again... It is too late in the day for him to be caught. It's Carapaz's to lose, and he's got to make sure 
he gets this descent just right. Less than a kilometre to go until the top of the Col de Noye. This was where the damage had to be done. And Richard Carapaz has certainly done that. 15 seconds now between him and Simon Yates and the gap is growing. Incredible crowds at the top of the Col de Noye. And for the moment, there is no sight of what was going on in the peloton. Giulio Giacone's little trek tried to take it up. Whether they've been reeled back in by UAE, I'm not so sure. It looked like they were being reeled in last time they went to the peloton. But Simon Yates is in struggle town right now. He's dangling at 15 seconds behind Richard Carapaz. But he's got to keep the mentality strong. Carapaz has hit out of glory. He's churning the pedals. He's in a race against time. And he's got to make it to the top of this climb with enough time on Yates. Yates and Mass can work together, potentially, if they catch each other. But again, Mass has to gain a lot of time for that to happen. EF Easy Post, who, to begin with, tactically, were so poor at chasing down breakaways, have got one man into the chase, and sometimes that is all you need. One man in a big group, as long as he works well, and he tactically delivers... He can provide you a victory. And at the moment, Richard Carapaz is doing just that. They must have been complaining about crowds on, on this climb because they, the amount of people on the Col de Noye at the summit is quite ridiculous. And that was probably why they were saying that cars cannot make it up the climb. 150 metres remain for Richard Carapaz. He's on his own at the front of the race, but the gap has remained at 15 seconds to Simon Yates. He stemmed the flow a little bit. And at the moment, by the looks of things, is gradually closing in. So Carapaz, with a look behind, can see he's not there, but has to continue. He goes over the top of the Category 1 climb. He'll take 10 points for his King of the Mountains bid, but I'm not sure he cares about that for now. Yates has limited the damage to only around 13 seconds at this point. Crosses the line, takes bonus seconds and King of the Mountains points. Of course, neither of those will matter to him. And Enric Mass will go over the climb in third. But it's 12 seconds between Simon Yates and Richard Carapaz. This stage is more than on. EF, of course, plunged so much of their budget into Richard Carapaz in 2023, took him to the Tour de France as a potential GC rival to Pogacar and Vingegaard. Of course, they said that to Netflix. But that all went away on stage one in a crash with Enric Mass. And now both of these riders occupy the top three positions on the road. Oscar Onley and Lawrence de Plus go over the top of the Côte de Noyer. But again, they're too far back, and barring incident or accident from these front three, will not be contesting the stage win, which at the moment is in the hands of Richard Carapaz, who is trying to nail every corner of this descent. He's got to get them all right. And Aaron Baru takes the last of the King of the Mountains points at the moment. Simon Yates is losing time to Russia Carapaz on the descent. It's gone up by eight seconds since going over the top of the Col de Noye. Carapaz is so used to altitude. This isn't necessarily high altitude by any means. But he's a man that grew up climbing. And he's going to use every year of experience to focus on going downhill as well as uphill. 
two kilometers until the top of the climb and little trek continue to try and line the peloton out past the Sandy du Jardin fan club. And it's Carlos Verona that's doing the job at the moment, not causing any major damage that Giulio Ciccone would want. But at the moment, the damage is going into the time gap between Simon Yates and Richard Carapaz. It's now 19 seconds, hovering at 20. And on this flatter section, it's time to prove that you've got the legs. Yates closes the gap by a second. 8 minutes and 37 to the peloton. Once again, I don't think that the yellow jersey group will see any action of note. Roman Gregoire wins the combativity prize of the day. As Matteo Jorgensen has now been distanced from the yellow jersey group. So that's a key domestique for Jonas Vingegaard distanced. Again with the bonus seconds gone and the stage win well up the road. There's going to be no gains on bonus seconds in the GC. So it's all going to be down to time on the road if they can take any. I think Henrik Mass has called it quits on the stage when he's at 44 seconds now. And this is indeed Matteo Jorgensen and Wilco Kelderman being dropped off the back of the yellow jersey group. Jorgensen at 12th overall. Felix Gau will be moving up one position at the very least if he's still in that group. Although I don't think he is. Oh no he is, I can see him sat centre of the road. And Remco Avenepol is making his way up to Joao Almeida, who is pacing on the front. A little word on the radio from Teddy Pogaccia. Jonas Vindigar sits third wheel, sat on the rear wheel of Remco Avenepol in the white jersey. I really thought Remco was winding up an attack there. But at the moment... It's Almeida, followed by Remco Avenepol, followed by Jonas Vingegaard, followed by Tade Pogaccia, Mikel Lander, Derek G. Carlos Rodriguez is there as well. Felix Gial, Santiago Boitrago and Giulio Ciccone are the riders left in that group. Adam Yates hanging on as well to the rear. So three UAE Team Emirates riders against one Visma Lisa bike rider. But I think UAE Team Emirates will be looking to just get to the line without any time loss. That will suit them nicely. Of course, already have 3 minutes and 9 seconds overall on Jonas Vingegaard. But Joao Almeida continuing... To pull in the yellow jersey group, will we see an attack from anybody in that group? We're approaching the top of the climb. The crowds are thickening. And will we see an attack by any of the top two overall? And we do. The second I say that, Tadej Pogacar hits the go button. Jonas Vingegaard's got to try and get onto the wheel now. Pogacar attacks. Vingegaard gets seated and tries to follow. He's distanced from the wheel of Tadej Pogacar. Remco even a has got to follow Jonas Vingegaard as well. And he is trying to do so. Vingegaard accelerates once more. Remco even a follows. All three of them don't look too phased at the moment. And it is once again the top three in GC that are distancing themselves from the rest of the pack. Headed by the yellow jersey Tadej Pogacar. Jonas Vingegaard has closed the gap almost. Remco Evenepoel gets to the front and is actually dropping Jonas Vingegaard. So Vingegaard is making way and Remco Evenepoel is making his way forward potentially in the GC. He's closing the gap to Tade Pogaccia. The Astana Kazakhstan car not too well positioned on that switchback. But at the moment, Remco Evenepoel in the white jersey is the main challenger to Tade Pogaccia. Jonas Vingegaard is spent. Trying to follow the attack of Tadej Pogacar over the top of the climb. 
And suddenly, this stage, which was set to have no GC action, Tadej Pogacar has ripped up the script and said, no, thank you, I'm going to take control of this race myself. And he has certainly done that. He's dropped Remco Evenepoel, and he's dropped Jonas Vingegaard, and now he is continuing to try and increase that gap overall. This is the tour of Tadej. He's making it his. And Remco Evenepoel might be making his way up the general classification. Jonas Vingegaard has to stay careful, has to stay vigilant, has to stay within range of the wheel of Remco Evenepoel. But Tadej Pogacar is going to make it over the top of the climb and our stopwatches will begin. Over the top then goes Pogacar now. Just catching Harold Tejada over the top. The gap is 8 seconds to Remco Evenepoel. And from Remco Evenepoel to Jonas Vingegaard, it's 13. So 5 seconds behind is Vingegaard from Remco Evenepoel. Pogacar will be now catching riders in 1s and 2s down this descent. The first of which is from Intermarche Wanty. Pogacar is in a pursuit race now. And it will depend on who holds him up on the descent. Jonas Vingegaard has caught up with an important teammate in Christophe Laporte. Who can ferry him at least to the bottom of Super Devouli. Can he close to Remco Evenepoel? We know about Remco Evenepoel's descending capabilities. And his potential weaknesses in that regard. But our eyes have gone totally off Richard Carapaz for now. Three kilometres to go for the Ecuadorian. He's on the climb of Super Devoli. As Tadej Pogacar makes his way to the front. Remco Evenepoel has got to pass Harold Tejada. And I think it's George Zimmerman, could be wrong, to get to Tadej Pogacar. But this is Richard Carapaz with three kilometres remaining, on his own, also on his own Simon Yates. Just out of eye shot is Richard Carapaz. It looks like it's the Ecuadorians to lose. He's got an extensive gap over Simon Yates for now, who I think is in a battle to retain second place on the stage. Enric Mass sat third. As Pogacar is seemingly taking turns with Georg Zimmermann. So Pogacar's got a comrade. But one of which who's only going to take a couple of turns. Rather than go full on. On the front. And sacrifice himself in the same way that Christophe Laporte is doing. For Jonas Vingegaard at the moment. Pogacar still presses on, over 40 kilometres an hour. We're on the gradual descent now, the flatter portion of this descent. Pogacar looks over his right shoulder. Georg Zimmermann comes to the front and takes a turn. This could be perhaps an audition for the UAE team. And Christophe Laporte has caught Remco Evenepoel, who is continuing to press on on the flatter section. So Evenepoel once again caught in the descent. Potential weakness of his, but he's, at the moment, continuing to close on Tadej Pogacar. It's going to all come back together, seemingly. George Zimmerman is pacing on the front. Tadej Pogacar sat on his wheel. Then comes the next group on the road. Christophe Laporte just comes round the outside of Remco Evenepoel to take control of that second group. Jonas Vingegaard sat on the wheel of the Frenchman, the European champion. Doing a key turn to keep Jonas Vingegaard within range of Tadej Pogacar. But once again, Pogacar tests the water. And he's finding it to be a perfect temperature. Speaking of perfect temperature, Richard Carapaz has to keep his cool. The Ecuadorian's got 40 seconds on Simon Yates. 
Potentially you'll be getting the time gap through his earpiece now. Enric Mass closing in on Simon Yates as well. He's 10 seconds behind the Brit. And it looks like we'll have a battle for second place on the road. All of the rest of the group are joined together. Podarcha, Vingegaard and Remco Evenepoel are locked once more. But will Tade give it a go on the climb to Super Devoli? He went for the move. Vingegaard was first to respond. Remco sat on the wheel of Landa for a bit and then hit out. But it was Vingegaard who was the first of the three to crack. Poracha, look over the left hand shoulder. Laporte looks over the right for his teammate. And Remco even a pole attacks. He finds it the perfect time to go and launch an acceleration. Even a pole continues. He knows he's putting time into fourth place overall and the rest of his GC rivals. He's done it on the climb. He needs to hold it on the descent. And he knows he's racing for something totally different to Pogacar and Vingegaard. Somebody who's racing for the stage win at the moment is Richard Carapaz. Looks over his right shoulder, assesses the gap. The gap is 36 seconds. It's closed four seconds. But it's going to be too little, too late for Simon Yates. Carapaz gets out of the saddle, pushes once more, and he can see the finish line in sight. First, he gets to the Flamme Rouge. Crosses underneath it, one kilometre to go until the end of the stage. The two King of the Mountains points at the top of this climb will be totally meaningless to the Ecuadorian. He is going all in for stage honours. And he may just be about to complete the triptych of Vuelta a España stage win, Giro d'Italia stage win and Tour de France stage win. Out of the saddle gets Carapaz. Eight hundred meters remain for the Ecuadorian. Yates does the same, gets out of the saddle underneath one kilometer to go. There's over two hundred meters separating them on the road, and it's two hundred meters in favor of Richard Carapaz. He's got time to think about the celebration, but I'm not sure whether he is knows that at this rate. Enric Mass now goes under one kilometer to go. I don't think he'll be able to catch Simon Yates. But it's worth a try. Richard Carapaz gets onto the final percentages of this climb. The clock comes up over four hours in the saddle. It's been a hot day from minute one, both on the weather and on the roads. And Carapaz has proven he is the best of the breakaway. There's been a lot of moaning and complaining from the lack of a breakaway. Everybody wanted to be involved today. But at the end, one rider has proved to be better than the rest. And that rider is Richard Carapaz. EF Education Easy Post's last win came from Magnus Court. The moustache has gone blue. Magnus Court's gone red to Uno X. But Carapaz looks pretty in pink. Sits up on the bike. Embraces the crowd. And it's a stage win for Richard Carapaz at the Tour de France. It's stage win number seven on a Grand Tour for Carapaz, his first at the Tour de France. And Simon Yates will take second place. It was a performance that had heart. He was the first of the big riders to attack, gapped Carapaz and Stevie Williams, then held the gap to Enric Mass, but was caught by Carapaz and passed. Yates will finish second today, it's by no means over. The Jacob Alula leader will have other opportunities, I'm sure, at this tour. But he'll have to set settle for second today as Remco Evenepoel has dropped Jonas Vingegaard and Tade Pogacar on the road. Evenepoel's got himself a brief gap at the start of the Super Devil League climb. This is the white jersey imposing himself on the race. Goes past Dorian Gordon. Can Gordon stick to the wheel? Seemingly not, as Enric Mass crosses the line in third place. All of the bonus seconds have now gone. It's down to just time on the road. Little throwback to races of old in this case. And here was the attack. Avonapol out of the saddle, looks across, nobody inclined to respond. And Avonapol is hitting out now at the rest of the GC. 
No reaction from Jonas Vingegaard. No reaction from Tadej Pogacar. And the gap is growing to Remco Evenepoel. Who is shouting at Jan Hirt in the breakaway. He's got a teammate up the road as Lawrence as de Plus wins the sprint for fourth. So even a Pol's now got Jan Hirt, who is burying himself. Stefan Kung on the wheel of Remco even a Pol as well. But it is all about the white jersey at the moment. It's 20 seconds to Jonas Vingegaard. And this is even a Pol having his day in the sun. The first mountain stage of week three. And Remco even a Pol is imposing himself on this Tour de France. He's got a gap on Pogaccia and Vingegaard. And Vingegaard's got himself a new teammate to begin pacing. That teammate is Wild Van Aert. Pogaccia also has himself a comrade from UAE Team Emirates. That's Pavel Sivakov. As we get a view of Guillaume Martin crossing the line. Hit out with Valentin Madouin. But it was a little too early from Guillaume Martin. And Hirt is hitting out at the moment. He's feeling the burn on the legs. Remco even a pole sat in the wheel. Looks fairly efficient in his pedal stroke. Catching two of the DSM Fernick Postenel riders at the moment, Bardet and Bardi. But this is the new wave that have taken over the Tour de France. Visma Lisa Bike now have two riders at the front. Trying to close this gap for Jonas Vingegaard. Teich Benoit and Wout van Aert, who were involved in the breakaway, are now in a battle with Jan Hirt, who has Remco Evenepoel on his wheel. How much time can Evenepoel take, if any, on Jonas Vingegaard? Bardet looks over his shoulder. He knows what the gap is. Remco Evenepoel doesn't seem interested. I've not seen him look over his shoulder once. He's got two kilometres until the top of Super Devouli. The time gap to Richard Carapaz will be huge, but the time gaps to Jonas Vingegaard and Tadej Pogacar will be the key ones to watch if you're Remco Evenepoel. Sudal quick step having a good tour de France in terms of GC. They've not been in this situation for a while. They, of course, have had Enric Mass on their books before. He finished third today. Third in the GC is Remco Evenepoel. And is giving Belgians some new hope at this Tour de France. And he's giving them new hope by putting pressure on the Dutch team. Visma Lisa bike. Pavel Sivakov sat at the rear of the group. Tadi Pogacar stuck to the wheel of Jonas Vingegaard at the moment. He's given it a go. He's found out that he can drop Vingegaard, at least on the Col de Noyer. But the Mayo Jean group are closing in on the white jersey. Even a has got to continue his effort. It may only be a couple of seconds. Van Aert continues, but he might go pop fairly soon. And he will hand over to Teich Benoit to do the final couple of kilometres on the Super Devu Leap. The time gap is back up to around 20 seconds, says the TV, but I'm not sure whether to trust that. And this is the situation on the road. Van Aert has indeed gone pop. Hands over to Teich Benoit who has to pilot Jonas Vingegaard to the line and lose as little time as possible to Remco Evenepoel. One kilometre now to the top of Super Devouli and Remco is on his own. Remco is now on an individual time trial to get to the top of Super Devouli as fast as he can and get as much time between him and Jonas Vingegaard on the road. Tadej Pogaccia might have something to say about that with a late attack, because that's what Tadej Pogacar does. Remco looks over his right shoulder for the first time. Not a great time to do it round the corner. But I'm sure he got a message through his ear of the gap. Avonapol first mountain stage 
could finish the best of the GC riders on this day. He's got 500 metres until he reaches the end of his stage and the finish. And he continues to press those pedals hard. Starts to dig in. He's got about 20 seconds of effort remaining as the cameras cut out. And Pogaccia attacks, so this is exactly what we were expecting. How much gap can he close to Remco Avenapol? Will Avenapol make it over first? You'd expect so. The gap was extensive enough that he could make it over the top of the climb first. Rounds the final corner. It's a long final right-hander towards the line. And we will begin the stopwatch once more. Avenapol is about to cross the line and will make gains, but how many gains? 7 minutes 13 down on the day, Pogaccia sprints away from Jonas Vinyagor and will take a couple of extra seconds. 7 minutes 13 to Remco Avenapol, 10 seconds on Tane Pogaccia, 12 seconds on Jonas Vinyagor. And that was a great little stage. Richard Carapaz is your winner. But we have seen GC action. I did not think we would see GC action. Here's the attack of Pogaccia getting replayed. On the right hand side. Lethal move. Vingegaar cannot keep up. With the amount of watts Pogaccia is pushing. Out of the saddle. Really tries. Ends up going back seated. Pogaccia still out of the saddle. And increases the gap. On the road in terms of distance, but it's flatter terrain, so the time gap will be similar. And now we see where the rest of the GC contenders finish. Somebody who will fly up the GC is Richard Carapaz. He's not interested in that at all, though. He's the stage winner for EF Education Easy Post. And that is complete now. Giro d'Italia stage win. Vuelta Espana stage win, Tour de France stage win. He joins the esteemed club. And what a stage it was. We've done, what, four hours, over four hours on this stream, and it was well worth it. If all of the rest of week three can be as entertaining as that, I would say yes, please, and thank you. But that's your result then, after four hours on the road. What a stage. What a stage. Well, and there we are. And that's all we've got time for today. Um, yeah. What, what a day. What a day. It's been a real tough one for me personally. Um, but I really enjoyed the racing on the road. And I hope to see you all, not tomorrow, because I'm not streaming tomorrow, unfortunately, but Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, we will stream those final three days. Uninterrupted, pretty much the whole day, especially the time trial. I think we're going to do the whole day for the time trial and do some tier list.